The Assignation by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Assignation. Stay for me there, I will not fail, to meet thee in that hollow vale. Exequy on the death of his wife by Henry King, Bishop of Chichester. Ill-fated and mysterious man, bewildered in the brilliancy of thine own imagination, and fallen in the flames of thine own youth, again in fancy I behold thee. Once more thy form hath risen before me, not, O oh, not as thou art, in the cold valley and shadow, but as thou shouldst be, squandering away a life of magnificent meditation in that city of dim visions, thine own Venice, which is a star-beloved Elysium of the sea, and the wide windows of whose Palladian palaces look down with a deep and bitter meaning upon the secrets of her silent waters. Yes, I repeat it as thou shouldst be. There are surely other worlds than this, other thoughts than the thoughts of the multitude, other speculations than the speculations of the sophist. Who then shall call thy conduct into question? Who blame thee for thy visionary hours, or denounce those occupations as a wasting away of life, which were but the overflowings of thine everlasting energies? It was at Venice, beneath the covered archway there called the Ponte di Sospiri, that I met for the third or fourth time the person of whom I speak. It is with a confused recollection that I bring to mind the circumstances of that meeting, yet I remember, ah, how should I forget, the deep midnight, the bridge of sighs, the beauty of woman, and the genius of romance that stalked up and down the narrow canal. It was a night of unusual gloom. The great clock of the piazza had sounded the fifth hour of the Italian evening. The square of the Campanile lay silent and deserted, and the lights in the old ducal palace were dying fast away. I was returning home from the piazzetta by way of the Grand Canal, but as my gondola arrived opposite the mouth of the Canal San Marco, a female voice from its recesses broke suddenly upon the night in one wild, hysterical, and long-continued shriek. Startled at the sound, I sprang upon my feet, while the gondolier, letting slip his single oar, lost it in the pitchy darkness beyond a chance of recovery, and we were consequently left to the guidance of the current, which here sets from the greater into the smaller channel. Like some huge and sable-feathered condor, we were slowly drifting down toward the bridge of sighs, when a thousand flambeaux flashing from the windows and down the staircases of the ducal palace turned all at once that deep gloom into a livid and preternatural day. A child, slipping from the arms of its own mother, had fallen from an upper window of the lofty structure into the deep and dim canal. The quiet waters had closed placidly over their victim, and although my own gondola was the only one in sight, many a stout swimmer, already in the stream, was seeking in vain upon the surface the treasure which was to be found, alas, only within the abyss. Upon the broad black marble flagstones at the entrance of the palace, and a few steps above the water, stood a figure which none who then saw can have ever since forgotten. It was the Marchesa Aphrodite, the adoration of all Venice, the gayest of the gay, the most lovely, where all were beautiful, but still the young wife of the old and intriguing Mentoni, and the mother of that fair child, her first and only one, who now, deep beneath the murky water, was thinking in bitterness of heart upon her sweet caresses, and exhausting its little life in struggles to call upon her name. 
She stood alone, her small, bare, and silvery feet gleamed in the black mirror of marble beneath her, her hair not as yet more than half loosened for the night from its ballroom array, clustered amid a shower of diamonds, round and round her classical head, in curls like those of the young Hyacinth. A snowy white and gauze-like drapery seemed to be nearly the sole covering of her delicate form, but the midsummer and midnight air was sullen and still, and no motion in the statue-like form itself stirred even the folds of that raiment of very vapour which hung around it as the heavy marble hangs around the Niobe. Yet, strange to say, her large, lustrous eyes were not turned downward upon that grave wherein her brightest hope lay buried, but riveted in a widely different direction. The prison of the old republic is, I think, the stateliest building in all Venice, but how could that lady gaze so fixedly upon it when beneath her lay stifling her own child? Yon dark, gloomy niche, too, yawns right opposite her chamber window. What, then, could there be in its shadows, in its architecture, in its ivy-wreathed and solemn cornices, that the Marchesa di Mentoni had not wondered at a thousand times before? Nonsense! Who does not remember that at such a time as this the eye, like a shattered mirror, multiplies the images of its sorrow, and sees in innumerable far-off places the woe which is close at hand? Many steps above the Marchesa, and within the arch of the water gate, stood in full dress the satyr-like figure of Mentoni himself. He was occasionally occupied in thrumming a guitar, and seemed ennuyé to the very death, as at intervals he gave directions for the recovery of his child. Stupefied and aghast, I had myself no power to move from the upright position I had assumed upon first hearing the shriek and must have presented to the eyes of the agitated group a spectral and ominous appearance, as with pale countenance and rigid limbs I floated down among them in that funereal gondola. All efforts proved in vain. Many of the most energetic in the search were relaxing their exertions and yielding to a gloomy sorrow. There seemed but little hope for the child, how much less than for the mother. But now, from the interior of that dark niche, which has been already mentioned as forming a part of the old Republican prison, and as fronting the lattice of the Marchesa, a figure muffled in a cloak stepped out within reach of the light, and, pausing a moment upon the verge of the giddy descent, plunged headlong into the canal as, in an instant afterward, he stood with a still-living and breathing child within his grasp. Upon the marble flagstones, by the side of the Marchesa, his cloak, heavy with the drenching water, became unfastened, and, falling in folds about his feet, discovered to the wonder-stricken spectators the graceful person of a very young man, with the sound of whose name the greater part of Europe was then ringing. No word spoke the deliverer, but the Marchesa, she will now receive her child, she will press it to her heart, she will cling to its little form and smother it with her caresses. Alas, another's arms have taken it from the stranger, another's arms have taken it away, and borne it afar off, unnoticed, into the palace, and the Marchesa, her lip, her beautiful lip trembles, tears are gathering in her eyes, those eyes which, like Pliny's acanthus, are soft and almost liquid. Yes, tears are gathering in those eyes, and see, the entire woman thrills throughout the soul, and the statue has started into life. The pallor of the marble countenance, the swelling of the marble bosom, the very purity of the marble feet, we behold suddenly flushed over with a tide of ungovernable crimson, and a slight shudder quivers about her delicate frame, as a gentle air at Napoli about the rich silver lilies in the grass. 
Why should that lady blush? To this demand there is no answer except that, having left in the eager haste and terror of a mother's heart the privacy of her own boudoir, she has neglected to enthrall her tiny feet in their slippers, and utterly forgotten to throw over her Venetian shoulders that drapery which is their due. What other possible reason could there have been for her so blushing, for the glance of those wild appealing eyes, for the unusual tumult of that throbbing bosom, for the convulsive pressure of that trembling hand, that hand which fell as Mentoni turned into the palace accidentally upon the hand of the stranger? What reason could there have been for the low, the singularly low tone of those unmeaning words which the lady uttered hurriedly in bidding him adieu? Thou hast conquered, she said, or the murmurs of the water deceived me. Thou hast conquered one hour after sunrise. We shall meet, so let it be. The tumult had subsided, the lights had died away within the palace, and the stranger, whom I now recognized, stood alone upon the flags. He shook with inconceivable agitation, and his eye glanced around in search of a gondola. I could not do less than offer him the service of my own, and he accepted the civility. Having obtained an oar at the water gate, we proceeded together to his residence, while he rapidly recovered his self-possession and spoke of our former slight acquaintance in terms of great apparent cordiality. There are some subjects upon which I take pleasure in being minute. The person of the stranger, let me call him by this title, who to all the world was still a stranger, the person of the stranger is one of these subjects. In height, he might have been below rather than above the medium size, although there were moments of intense passion when his frame actually expanded and belied the assertion. The light, almost slender symmetry of his figure promised more of that ready activity which he evinced at the Bridge of Sighs than of that Herculean strength which he has been known to wield without an effort upon occasions of more dangerous emergency. With the mouth and chin of a deity, singular, wild, full, liquid eyes whose shadows varied from pure hazel to intense and brilliant jet, and a profusion of curling black hair, from which a forehead of unusual breadth gleamed forth at intervals, all light and ivory. His were features than which I have seen none more classically regular, except perhaps the marble ones of the Emperor Commodus. Yet his countenance was nevertheless one of those which all men have seen at some period of their lives, and have never afterward seen again. It had no peculiar, it had no settled predominant expression to be fastened upon the memory, a countenance seen and instantly forgotten, but forgotten with a vague and never-ceasing desire of recalling it to mind. Not that the spirit of each rapid passion failed at any time to throw its own distinct image upon the mirror of that face, but that the mirror mere-like, retained no vestige of the passion when the passion had departed. Upon leaving him on the night of our adventure, he solicited me, in what I thought an urgent manner, to call upon him very early the next morning. Shortly after sunrise, I found myself accordingly at his palazzo, one of those huge structures of gloomy yet fantastic pomp which tower above the waters of the Grand Canal in the vicinity of the Rialto. I was shown up a broad, winding staircase of mosaics into an apartment whose unparalleled splendor burst through the opening door with an actual glare making me blind and dizzy with luxuriousness. I knew my acquaintance to be wealthy, 
Report had spoken of his possessions in terms which I had even ventured to call terms of ridiculous exaggeration, but as I gazed about me, I could not bring myself to believe that the wealth of any subject in Europe could have supplied the princely magnificence which burned and blazed around. Although, as I say, the sun had arisen, yet the room was still brilliantly lighted up. I judge from this circumstance, as well as from an air of exhaustion in the countenance of my friend, that he had not retired to bed during the whole of the preceding night. In the architecture and embellishments of the chamber, the evident design had been to dazzle and astound. Little attention had been paid to the decor of what is technically called keeping or to the proprieties of nationality. The eye wandered from object to object and rested upon none, neither the grotesques of the Greek painters, nor the sculptures of the best Italian days, nor the huge carvings of untutored Egypt. Rich draperies in every part of the room trembled to the vibration of low melancholy music whose origin was not to be discovered. The senses were oppressed by mingled and conflicting perfumes, reeking up from strange convolute censers, together with the multitudinous flaring and flickering tongues of emerald and violet fire. The rays of the newly risen sun poured in upon the whole, through windows formed each of a single pane of crimson-tinted glass. Glancing to and fro, in a thousand reflections from curtains which rolled from their cornices like cataracts of molten silver, the beams of natural glory mingled at length fitfully with the artificial light and lay weltering in subdued masses upon a carpet of rich, liquid-looking cloth of Chile gold. <laughs> laughed the proprietor, motioning me to a seat as I entered the room and throwing himself back at full length upon an ottoman. I see, said he, perceiving that I could not immediately reconcile myself to the bien-sens of so singular a welcome, I see you are astonished at my apartment, at my statues, my pictures, my originality of conception in architecture and upholstery, absolutely drunk, eh, with my magnificence? But pardon me, my dear sir, here his tone of voice dropped to the very spirit of cordiality. Pardon me for my uncharitable laughter. You appeared so utterly astonished. Besides, some things are so completely ludicrous that a man must laugh or die. To die laughing must be the most glorious of all glorious deaths. Sir Thomas More, a very fine man was Sir Thomas More. Sir Thomas More died laughing, you remember. Also in the absurdities of Ravisius Textor, there is a long list of characters who came to the same magnificent end. Do you know, however, continued he musingly, that at Sparta, which is now Paleochorai, at Sparta, I say, to the west of the citadel, among a chaos of scarcely visible ruins, is a kind of sorcle, upon which are still legible the letters Lambda Alpha Xi Mu. They are undoubtedly part of Galaxma. Now, at Sparta, were a thousand temples and shrines to a thousand different divinities. How exceedingly strange that the altar of laughter should have survived all the others. But in the present instance, he resumed with a singular alteration of voice and manner, I have no right to be merry at your expense. You might well have been amazed. Europe cannot produce anything so fine as this, my little regal cabinet. My other apartments are by no means of the same order, mere ultras of fashionable insipidity. This is better than fashion, is it not? Yet this has but to be seen, to become the rage, that is, with those who could afford it at the cost of their entire patrimony. 
I have guarded, however, against any such profanation, with one exception. You are the only human being, besides myself and my valet, who has been admitted within the mysteries of these imperial precincts, since they have been bedizened, as you see. I bowed in acknowledgment for the overpowering sense of splendor and perfume and music, together with the unexpected eccentricity of his address and manner, prevented me from expressing in words my appreciation of what I might have construed into a compliment. Here, he resumed, arising and leaning on my arm as he sauntered around the apartment, here are paintings from the Greeks to Cimabue, and from Cimabue to the present hour. Many are chosen, as you see, with little deference to the opinions of Virtu. They are all, however, fitting tapestry for chambers such as this. Here, too, are some chefs of the unknown great, and here, unfinished designs by men celebrated in their day, whose very name the perspicacity of the academies has left to silence and to me. What think you, said he, turning abruptly as he spoke, what think you of this Madonna della Pietà? It is Guido's own, I said, with all the enthusiasm of my nature, for I had been poring intently over its surpassing loveliness. It is Guido's own. How could you have obtained it? She is undoubtedly in painting what the Venus is in sculpture. Ha, said he thoughtfully, the Venus, the beautiful Venus, the Venus of the Medici, she of the diminutive head and the gilded hair. Part of the left arm, here his voice dropped, so as to be heard with difficulty, and all the right are restorations, and in the coquetry of the right arm lies, I think, the quintessence of all affectation. Give me the Canova. The Apollo, too, is a copy. There can be no doubt of it. Blind fool that I am, who cannot behold the boasted inspiration of the Apollo? I cannot help, pity me, I cannot help preferring the Antonus. Was it not Socrates who said that the statuary found his statue in the block of marble? Then Michelangelo was by no means original in his couplet. Non noloti martista alcun concetto, con marmo solo in se non circoscriva. It has been or should be remarked that in the manner of the true gentleman we are always aware of a difference from the bearing of the vulgar, without being at once precisely able to determine in what such difference consists. Allowing the remark to have applied in its full force to the outward demeanour of my acquaintance, I felt it on that eventful morning still more fully applicable to his moral temperament and character, nor can I better define that peculiarity of spirit which seemed to place him so essentially apart from all other human beings than by calling it a habit of intense and continual thought, pervading even his most trivial actions, intruding upon his moments of dalliance, and interweaving itself with his very flashes of merriment, like adders which writhe from out the eyes of the grinning masks in the cornices around the temple of Persepolis. I could not help, however, repeatedly observing, through the mingled tone of levity and solemnity with which he rapidly descanted upon matters of little importance, a certain air of trepidation, a degree of nervous unction in action and in speech, an unquiet excitability of manner which appeared to me at all times unaccountable, and upon some occasions even filled me with alarm. Frequently, too, pausing in the middle of a sentence whose commencement he had apparently forgotten, he seemed to be listening in the deepest attention, as if either in momentary expectation of a visitor, or to sounds which must have had existence in his imagination alone. It was during one of these reveries or pauses of apparent abstraction that in turning over a page of the poet and scholar Politian's beautiful tragedy, the Orfeo, the first native Italian tragedy, which lay near me upon an ottoman, I discovered a passage underlined in pencil. It was a passage toward the end of the third act, 
a passage of the most heart-stirring excitement, a passage which, although tainted with impurity, no man shall read without a thrill of novel emotion, no woman without a sigh. The whole page was blotted with fresh tears, and upon the opposite interleaf were the following English lines, written in a hand so very different from the peculiar characters of my acquaintance that I had some difficulty in recognizing it as his own. Thou wast that all to me, love, for which my soul did pine, a green isle in the sea, love, a fountain and a shrine, all wreathed with fairy fruits and flowers, and all the flowers were mine. Ah, dream too bright to last, ah, starry hope that didst arise but to be overcast. A voice from out the future cries, onward but o'er the past. Dim gulf my spirit hovering lies, mute, motionless, aghast. For alas, alas, with me, the light of life is o'er. No more, no more, no more. Such language holds the solemn sea to the sands upon the shore. Shall bloom the thunder-blasted tree, or the stricken eagle soar. Now all my hours are trances, and all my nightly dreams are where the dark eye glances, and where thy footstep gleams, in what ethereal dances, by what Italian streams. Alas, for that accursed time they bore thee o'er the billow, from love to titled age and crime, and an unholy pillow from me and from our misty clime where weeps the silver willow. That these lines were written in English, a language with which I had not believed their author acquainted, afforded me little matter of surprise. I was too well aware of the extent of his acquirements, and of the singular pleasure he took in concealing them from observation, to be astonished at any similar discovery. But the place of date, I must confess, occasioned me no little amazement. It had been originally London, and afterward carefully overscored, not, however, so effectually as to conceal the word from a scrutinizing eye. I say this occasioned me no little amazement, for I well remember that, in a former conversation with my friend, I particularly inquired if he had at any time met in London the Marchesa di Mentoni, who for some years previous to her marriage had resided in that city, when his answer, if I mistake not, gave me to understand that he had never visited the metropolis of Great Britain. I might as well here mention that I have more than once heard, without of course giving credit to a report involving so many improbabilities, that the person of whom I speak was not only by birth, but in education, an Englishman. There is one painting, said he, without being aware of my notice of the tragedy, there is still one painting which you have not seen, and throwing aside a drapery, he discovered a full-length portrait of the Marchesa Aphrodite. Human art could have done no more in the delineation of her superhuman beauty. The same ethereal figure which stood before me the preceding night upon the steps of the ducal palace stood before me once again, but in the expression of the countenance, which was beaming all over with smiles, there still lurked incomprehensible anomaly, that fitful stain of melancholy which will ever be found inseparable from the perfection of the beautiful. Her right arm lay folded over her bosom. With her left, she pointed downward to a curiously fashioned vase. One small fairy foot, alone visible, barely touched the earth, and scarcely discernible in the brilliant atmosphere which seemed to encircle and enshrine her loveliness, floated a pair of the most delicately imagined wings. My glance fell from the painting to the figure of my friend, and the vigorous words of Chapman's Bousset d'Amboise quivered instinctively upon my lips. He is up, there like a Roman statue. He will stand till death hath made him marble. 
Come, he said at length, turning toward a table of richly enameled and massive silver, upon which were a few goblets fantastically stained, together with two large Etruscan vases, fashioned in the same extraordinary model as that in the foreground of the portrait, and filled with what I supposed to be Johannesburger. Come, he said abruptly, let us drink. It is early, but let us drink. It is indeed early, he continued, musingly, as a cherub with a heavy golden hammer made the apartment ring with the first hour after sunrise. It is indeed early, but what matters it? Let us drink. Let us pour out an offering to yon solemn sun, which these gaudy lamps and censers are so eager to subdue. And having made me pledge him a bumper, he swallowed in rapid succession several goblets of the wine. To dream, he continued, resuming the tone of his desultory conversation as he held up to the rich light of a censer one of the magnificent vases. To dream has been the business of my life. I have therefore framed for myself, as you see, a bower of dreams, and the heart of Venice could I have erected a better. You behold around you, it is true, a medley of architectural embellishments. The chastity of Ionia is offended by antediluvian devices, and the sphinxes of Egypt are outstretched upon carpets of gold. Yet the effect is incongruous to the timid alone. Proprieties of place, and especially of time, are the bugbears which terrify mankind from the contemplation of the magnificent. Once I was myself a decorist, but that sublimation of folly has palled upon my soul. All this is now the fitter for my purpose. Like these arabesque censers, my spirit is writhing in fire, and the delirium of this scene is fashioning me for the wilder visions of that land of real dreams, whither I am now rapidly departing. Here he paused abruptly, bent his head to his bosom, and seemed to listen to a sound which I could not hear. At length, erecting his frame, he looked upwards and ejaculated the lines of the Bishop of Chichester, Stay for me there, I will not fail to meet thee in that hollow vale. In the next instant, confessing the power of the wine, he threw himself at full length upon an ottoman. A quick step was now heard upon the staircase, and a loud knock at the door rapidly succeeded. I was hastening to anticipate a second disturbance, when a page of Mentoni's household burst into the room, and faltered out in a voice choking with emotion the incoherent words, My mistress! My mistress! Poison! Poison! Oh, beautiful! Oh, beautiful Aphrodite! Bewildered, I flew to the ottoman and endeavored to arouse the sleeper to a sense of the startling intelligence. But his limbs were rigid, his lips were livid, his lately beaming eyes were riveted in death. I staggered back toward the table, my hand fell upon a cracked and blackened goblet, and a consciousness of the entire and terrible truth flashed suddenly over my soul. End of the Assignation by Edgar Allan Poe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bizaban by Mur Yukai, also known as Maurice Jokai, translated by Louis Felberman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bizaban such is the name of the deaf and dumb boy who waits upon the sultan. The art of manufacturing these bizabans is very simple, and at Gozond there are several hundred professors of it who find it lucrative enough. From poor people who possess families, they buy children at ten or twenty rupees apiece, mere infants, a twelve-month-old. As yet, of course, they cannot talk. These men begin by pouring into the ears of the little creatures a fluid prepared from herbs which renders them absolutely deaf. 
Two-thirds of the children die under the process. Those which survive are valuable articles of commerce. Having lost their hearing, they can, of course, no longer learn to talk, and they remain dumb, as well as deaf, for life. These children, as they grow up, see the world around them, but cannot comprehend what they see. Their native intelligence cannot become developed. They are like human beings, from whom the soul has been snatched. These soulless boys are very valuable articles in the seraglio. They are always hovering around the sultan. In the most secret chambers they are in attendance. The most valuable documents are entrusted to their care. And beneath their eyes passes all the private correspondence between the sultan and his confidential advisers. They do not hear a syllable of any conversation. Of such a thing as speech they have no conception. How can they imagine what those peculiarly shaped letters mean which their eyes behold? There is no corresponding knowledge or intelligence within them which would render this possible, and the few things which they both see and understand they could not communicate to other people. Such were the unfortunate Bizabans. Nevertheless, they were dressed in purple and silk robes, long chains of pearls hung from their neck, and they were fed upon what overflowed from the sultan's own table. In all respects they were treated with a special consideration, like monkeys or parrots, which are kept as playthings. These creatures, deprived of soul, know how to do one or two things, but no more. They understand that they must remain on guard at a certain post and not move thence. They can carry a certain article to a certain place. They can cut the sultan's nails to beautiful fine points and adjust his turban. Such is the utmost limit of their accomplishments. They are indeed like dogs taught to fetch and carry things for their masters in their mouth. Before Sultan Mustafa II ascended the throne, he already possessed a number of Bizabans. One of these was his especial favorite, a boy who was quite superior to the rest and who excited more sympathy, for in his big dreamy eyes so much sentiment and intelligence was visible that it seemed sad that he could not be taught to feel and think like a human being. Like other Bizabans, he had no name. He won't hear it, even if it is addressed to him. As a rule, the Bizaban also fulfilled the office of eunuch and walked freely into the seraglio. Prince Mustafa used often, by the hand of his pet Bizaban, to send to his sister the beautiful Saliha, presents of a certain kind of very choice melon, which only grew in the sultan's garden, and concerning which fruit a very sad story was told. One day, noticing that one melon was missing from the beds, the sultan had all his gardeners tortured that the culprit might confess his theft. Then, when this experiment failed, he had seven of them cut open, to no purpose, but when the eighth was ripped up, fragments of the melon were revealed, which was very fortunate, as a few hundred other servants would, but for this, have been treated likewise. The lovely Saliha was a very kind-hearted creature. She thought her brother's Bizaban was a very sweet and gentle little thing, and she did not hesitate to pet him. She tried to make him understand this and that, and he seemed to have a very quick intelligence. Why should he not one day possess a soul? This idea occurred to her as she was walking on one occasion in the shrubbery. Could she not give back to him the soul of which he had been deprived? Could she not teach him the alphabet? If she showed him a certain letter, and then pointed to some object with which he was familiar, could he not by degrees be made acquainted with the world? Saliha made the experiment. She found it a very pleasant recreation, for life in the seraglio is extremely monotonous. We have heard that prisoners in their dungeons have even taught spiders to dance at the sound of music, and the seraglio as a place of detention is scarcely more exhilarating than a dungeon. Why should not the deaf and dumb boy prove as apt as a spider? At her first essay, Saliha was amazed to see how the soul of the Bizaban began to expand. 
He grasped anything in a moment. Once shown the alphabet, he could afterwards trace out each letter on the ground. Once shown the name of a certain article, he never forgot it. This success encouraged Saliha to further attempts. Would it not be possible to speak to the Bizaban? But how could the speaking be done so that no beholder comprehended it? Ah, with the hands. The human hand has five fingers, and their variety of motion as they open and shut is such that the entire alphabet might thereby be distinctly expressed. Saliha determined to teach the boy to converse with her by means of his fingers, and the success of her experiments exceeded her expectations. He quickly learned the secret signs. It was delightful to Saliha, and she determined to get amusement out of it too. She would extract from the Bizaban secrets concerning her brother, which he thought no one living knew, and then she would tease this relative by pretending that she had discovered them through the mystic words of the Kabbalah. Who would ever dream of suspecting a Bizaban who was deaf and dumb? After the death of Osman, Prince Mustafa ascended the throne. His youthful gaiety now quickly fled, his shoulders began to bend beneath the weight of the Turkish Empire, which was then already in a tottering condition, with enemies on every side. At that time the country possessed a great statesman in the person of Raghab Pasha, whose potent hand had preserved the empire from destruction. It was he who crushed the forces of the rebellious Egyptian princes and laid the province at the feet of the Padishah. Raghab was not only a hero in war, he was also a famous poet and the greatest scholar in the land. Historians describe him in his character of statesman as a leader of leaders, Jadar al-Vazir, and in that of writer as the prince of Rumelian poets, Sultani Shu'ari Rum. In his gigantic work entitled Zezinet Ololum, Ship of Knowledge, all the legends are collected which had lain scattered about the Arab plains. It was he who founded the splendid library which bears his name. At the time of which we now write, Saliha was in the very springtide of her beauty, like the lotus flower which opens its petals before the dew of dawn. Sultan Mustafa could not have given Raghib Pasha a greater reward than by bestowing upon him the hand of his lovely sister, and as to whether he inspired her with real affection, I need only say that he was fifty-nine when he married her, and that she loved him so much that when he died her mind became deranged. Raghab Pasha ruled not only over the Muslims, but also over the ruler of the Muslims, for he had divined the Sultan's thoughts, yes, his innermost thoughts. It was the Sultan's habit not to retire at night to his bedchamber until he had recorded in a voluminous diary all the events of the day and his impressions concerning them. This book he habitually kept in the secrecy of his own room, and the Bizaban watched over it until the morning. To whom would it ever have occurred that the deaf and dumb from birth could read, or that he could communicate the written lines to someone else? In the room where this diary was kept, there was a little window which opened into the Khazuda, the sultan's place of worship but it was so shut off from view by various corridors as to be only visible from the seraglio. Every evening, just as the sultan was leaving his apartments in order to go and say his final prayers in his sanctuary, the Murzims were accustomed to strike seven times with a hammer, a bell without a tongue. Then the imam, who stood before the altar, would say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Grace descends from heaven, which rules over all. Thereupon the congregation would fall on their faces. They remained prostrate until the sultan reached the door, when the imam would exclaim, Allahu Akbar, the Lord is powerful 
and all present rose to their feet. During the period of prostration, a secret hand would be stretched out from the little window we have mentioned, and would make all kinds of signs. No one noticed this hand except Saliha, who carefully watched its mysterious movements whilst she was upon her knees. From these signs, she knew everything that the Sultan had that day recorded in his diary, and the very same night she would whisper the information to her husband. Raghab Pasha was a wise man who knew how to keep such information secret. He thereby learned who his enemies were and managed to clear them out of his way. He got to know the wishes of the Sultan and could long before anticipate them. Everything he did was done in the name of the Sultan. The pomp and glory which he himself achieved, he allowed people to ascribe to his sovereign, and he even made Mustafa imagine that he ruled, whereas the feeble-hearted monarch was a mere puppet in the hands of his skillful grand vizier. In his poems, Raghab extolled the sultan for his mighty and politic deeds, eulogized him for inspecting the navy and the military magazines, for increasing the nation's revenue by six million piastres, and doing other things which Raghab himself had in fact done on his own account. Throughout Turkey, throughout Europe, it was known well enough that not the sultan, but his minister ruled at Stambul. It was only Mustafa who did not know it. One day, Raghab's enemies, Hamil Pasha, Bahir Mustafa, and Muhammad Amin, who were jealous of the minister's great power, said to the sultan, This man only calls you sultan in mockery. He does everything without you just as if the state were his. He has just concluded, without your knowledge, an alliance with the rulers of the infidel empires, an alliance which, although it may prove the destruction of other unfaithful nations, he should never have dared to make before obtaining the consent of his monarch, in whose presence he is nothing but dust. It was Frederick the Great, King of Prussia, who, believing in the wisdom of the distinguished minister, had invited his alliance, and the documents ratifying it had already been signed. Had the alliance been allowed to continue, perhaps the crescent of Turkey would have risen again. But the heart of Mustafa had been perturbed by these malicious whisperings. When the traders had left him, he said nothing, but simply ordered his bizaban to bring him his diary, wherein he proceeded to record his impressions of the day. Then shutting the book and giving it to the bizaban, he went to evening prayers. On this occasion the hand appeared at the little window and made certain signs which Saliha watched intently. They said, Escape, Raghab, the Sultan knows of your letter to the Prussian king. Tomorrow your head will be cut off and your documents confiscated. The Sultan returned from his profound devotions with a lightened heart. No one, he said to himself, knew his secret, and tomorrow morning he would send his executioner to fetch him Raghab's head. Yes, he longed to possess that head ignominiously severed from its trunk. But when the executioner reached the Grand Vizier's residence, he found there his dead body, which could no longer be killed. On his table lay a letter addressed to the Sultan and enclosed in a velvet envelope. It was taken to the Sovereign with the news that the minister had been found dead. The letter ran thus. Mustafa, the omniscient has vouchsafed in his mysterious providence to let me know that you wished to kill me, because without your knowledge I concluded, for the benefit of your dominion, an alliance with the king of Prussia. I did not run away from death, I simply anticipated it. I consider I have lived long enough in order to die fitly now, and long enough not to be forgotten. All the documents at my palace I have burned. You will see what I have done for your country. 
The rest will be said when we meet in presence of the great prophet. The sultan was paralyzed with wonder and fear. How could that secret, which had been locked up only in his own heart, have been divined by Raghab? First he accused the jinns, Christian prophets, then the Hindu soothsayers, then the interpreters of dreams, then the very pen with which he had written. How could he dream that the deaf and dumb could speak? When Mustafa endeavored to further the alliance with the king of Prussia, this great ruler of the infidels replied that there had until recently been one wise man in Turkey, but that he did not now propose to do business with fools. This was a bitter humiliation to the sultan to think that his late slave could have procured an alliance which was contemptuously refused to the king of kings. Mustafa frequently lamented the loss of Raghab and was constantly tortured by the mystery whereby the secret of his heart had been penetrated. After the grand vizier's death, the Bizaban ceased to communicate to Saliha the secrets of the sultan. He had no longer any motive to do so. First came Hamel, who only, however, remained grand vizier for six months, when he was executed for his negligence, and chroniclers relate of him that he let the empire go as it pleased, doing it neither good nor harm. Then followed the head of Bahar Mustafa. It was cut off for his barbarity. The third was Mohammed Amin, whom the sultan beheaded for cowardice on the battlefield. Mustafa shed tears over the loss of his three grand viziers, but not on their personal account, for he had never forgotten Raghab, who was so wise, brave, and noble. And whenever he beheaded one of his grand viziers, he would always think of the unfortunate Raghab. The Bizaban laughed within himself, for the deaf and dumb can laugh when they are alone. His secret no one ever knew. End of Bizaban by Mur Yukai Translated by Louis Felberman This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Carcassonne by Lord Dunsany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Carcassonne. Preliminary note by Lord Dunsany. In a letter from a friend whom I have never seen, one of those that read my books, this line was quoted. But he, he never came to Carcassonne. I do not know the origin of the line, but I made this tale about it. Carcassonne When Camarac reigned at Arn, and the world was fairer, he gave a festival to all the world to commemorate the splendor of his youth. They say that his house at Arn was huge and high and its ceiling painted blue, and when evening fell men would climb up by ladders and light the scores of candles hanging from slender chains. And they say too that sometimes a cloud would come and pour in through the top of one of the oriel windows, and it would come over the edge of the stonework as the sea mist comes over a sheer cliff's shaven lip where an old wind has blown for ever and ever. He has swept away thousands of leaves and thousands of centuries. They are all one to him. He owes no allegiance to time. And the cloud would reshape itself in the hall's lofty vault and drift on through it slowly and out to the sky again through another window and from its shape the knights in Camarac's hall would prophesy the battles and sieges of the next season of war. They say of the hall of Camarac at Arn that there hath been none like it in any land, and foretell that there will be never. 
Hither had come in the folk of the weld, from sheepfold and from forest, revolving slow thoughts of food and shelter and love, and they sat down wandering in the famous hall, and therein also were seated the men of Arn, the town that clustered round the king's high house, and all was roofed with red maternal earth. If old songs may be trusted, it was a marvellous hall. Many who sat there could only have seen it distantly before, a clear shape in the landscape, but smaller than a hill. Now they beheld along the wall the weapons of Camarac's men, of which already the lute players made songs, and tales were told at evening in the beers. There they described the shield of Camarac that had gone to and fro across so many battles, and the sharp but dinted edges of his sword. There were the weapons of Gadriel the Lel, and Norn, and Atheric of the Sleety Sword, Heriel the Wild, Yerold, and Thanga of Esk. Their arms hung evenly all round the hall, low where a man could reach them, and in the place of honour in the midst, between the arms of Camarac and of Gadriel the Lel, hung the harp of Arleon, and of all the weapons hanging on those walls, none were more calamitous to Camarac's foes than was the harp of Arleon, for to a man that goes up against a strong place on foot, pleasant indeed is the twang and jolt of some fearful engine of war that his fellow warriors are working behind him from which huge rocks go sighing over his head and plunge among his foes, and pleasant to a warrior in the wavering light are the swift commands of his king, and a joy to him are his comrades' instant cheers exulting suddenly at a turn of the war. All this and more was the harp to Camarac's men, for not only would it cheer his warriors on, but many a time would Arleon of the harp strike wild amazement into opposing hosts by some rapturous prophecy suddenly shouted out while his hand swept over the roaring strings. Moreover, no war was ever declared till Camarac and his men had listened long to the harp and were elate with the music and mad against peace. Once Arleon, for the sake of a rhyme, had made war upon Esteban, and an evil king was overthrown, and honour and glory won. From such queer motives does good sometimes accrue. Above the shields and the harps, all round the hall, were the painted figures of heroes of fabulous, famous songs. Too trivial, because too easily surpassed by Camarac's men, seemed all the victories that the earth had known. Neither was any trophy displayed of Camarac's seventy battles, for these were as nothing to his warriors or him, compared with those things that their youth had dreamed and which they mightily purposed yet to do. Above the painted pictures there was darkness, for evening was closing in, and the candles swinging on their slender chain were not yet lit in the roof. It was as though a piece of the night had been builded into the edifice like a huge natural rock that juts into a house. And there sat all the warriors of Arn, and the weld folk wondering at them. And none were more than thirty, and all were skilled in war. And Camarac sat at the head of all, exulting in his youth.
We must wrestle with time for some seven decades, and he is a weak and puny antagonist in the first three bouts. Now there was present at this feast a diviner, one who knew the schemes of fate, and he sat among the people of the world, and had no place of honour, for Camarac and his men had no fear of fate. And when the meat was eaten, and the bones cast aside, the king rose up from his chair, and having drunken wine, and been in the glory of his youth, and with all his knights about him, called to the diviner, saying, Prophesy. And the diviner rose up, stroking his grey beard, and spake guardedly, there are certain events, he said, upon the ways of fate that are veiled even from a diviner's eyes, and many more are clear to us that were better veiled from all. Much I know that is better unforetold, and some things that I may not foretell on pain of centuries of punishment, but this I know and foretell that you will never come to Carcassonne. Instantly there was a buzz of talk, telling of Carcassonne. Some had heard of it in speech or song, some had read of it, and some had dreamed of it. And the king sent Arleon of the harp down from his right hand to mingle with the weld folk, to hear aught that any told of Carcassonne. But the warriors told of the places they had won to, many a hard-held fortress, many a far-off land, and swore that they would come to Carcassonne. And in a while came Arleon back to the king's right hand, and raised his harp, and chanted, and told of Carcassonne. Far away it was, and far and far away, a city of gleaming ramparts, rising one over other, and marble terraces behind the ramparts, and fountains shimmering on the terraces. To Carcassonne the elf kings with their fairies had first retreated from men, and had built it on an evening late in May by blowing their elfin horns. Carcassonne! Carcassonne. Travellers had seen it sometimes like a clear dream, with the sun glittering on its citadel upon a far-off hilltop, and then the clouds had come, or a sudden mist. No one had seen it long, or come quite close to it, though once there were some men that came very near and the smoke from the houses blew into their faces, a sudden gust, no more, and these declared that someone was burning cedar wood there. Men had dreamed that there is a witch there, walking alone through the cold courts and corridors of Marmorian palaces, fearfully beautiful and still, for all her fourscore centuries, singing the second oldest song, which was taught her by the sea, shedding tears for loneliness from eyes that would madden armies. Yet will she not call her dragons home? Carcassonne is terribly guarded. Sometimes she swims in a marble bath, through whose deeps a river tumbles, or lies all morning on the edge of it to dry slowly in the sun, and watches the heaving river trouble the deeps of the bath. It flows through the caverns of earth for further than she knows, and coming to light in the witch's bath, goes down through the earth again to its own peculiar sea. In autumn sometimes it comes down black, with snow that spring has molten, in unimagined mountains, or withered blooms of mountain shrubs go beautifully by. 
when there is blood in the bath. She knows there is war in the mountains, and yet she knows not where those mountains are. When she sings, the fountains dance up from the dark earth. When she combs her hair, they say there are storms at sea. When she is angry, the wolves grow brave and all come down to the beers. When she is sad, the sea is sad and both are sad for ever. Carcasson, Carcasson. The city is the fairest of the wonders of morning. The sun shouts when he beholdeth it. For Carcassonne, evening weepeth when evening passeth away. And Arleon told how many goodly perils were round about the city, and how the way was unknown, and it was a knightly venture. Then all the warriors stood up and sang of the splendor of the venture. And Camarac swore by the gods that had builded on, and by the honor of his warriors, that, alive or dead, he would come to Carcassonne. But the diviner rose and passed out of the hall, brushing the crumbs from him with his hands and smoothing his robe as he went. Then Camarac said, There are many things to be planned, and counsels to be taken, and provender to be gathered. Upon what day shall we start? And all the warriors answering shouted, Now! And Camarac smiled thereat, for he had but tried them. Down then from the walls they took their weapons, Sycorix, Teleron, Asloff, Wool of the Axe, Huenoth, Peacebreaker, Woolwoof, Father of War, Terion, Lurth of the War Cry, and many another. Little then dreamed the spiders that sat in that ringing hall of the unmolested leisure they were soon to enjoy. When they were armed, they all formed up and marched out of the hall, and Arleon strode before them singing of Carcassonne. But the talk of the weld arose and went back well fed to the beers. They had no need of wars or of rare perils. They were ever at war with hunger. A long drought or hard winter were to them pitched battles. If the wolves entered a sheepfold, it was like the loss of a fortress. A thunderstorm on the harvest was like an ambuscade. Well fed, they went back slowly to their beers, being at truce with hunger, and the night filled with stars. And black against the starry sky appeared the round helms of the warriors as they passed the tops of the ridges. But in the valleys they sparkled now and then as the starlight flashed on steel. They followed behind Arleon, going south, whence rumors had always come of Carcassonne. So they marched in the starlight, and he before them, singing. When they had marched so far that they heard no sound from Arn, and even inaudible were her swinging bells, when candles burning late far up in towers no longer sent them their disconsolate welcome. In the midst of the pleasant night that lulls the rural spaces, weariness came upon Arleon, and his inspiration failed. It failed slowly. Gradually he grew less sure of the way to Carcassonne. A while he stopped to think and remembered the way again, but his clear certainty was gone and in its place were efforts in his mind to recall old prophecies and shepherds' songs that told of the marvellous city. 
Then, as he said over carefully to himself a song that a wanderer had learnt from a goat herd's boy far up the lower slope of ultimate southern mountains, fatigue came down upon his toiling mind like snow on the winding ways of a city noisy by night, stilling all. He stood, and the warriors closed up to him. For long they had passed by great oaks, standing solitary here and there, like giants taking huge breaths of the night air before doing some furious deed. Now they had come to the verge of a black forest. The tree trunks stood like those great columns in an Egyptian hall whence God in an older mood received the praises of men. The top of it sloped the way of an ancient wind. Here they all halted and lighted a fire of branches, striking sparks from flint into a heap of bracken. They eased them of their armor, and sat round the fire, and Camarac stood up there, and addressed them, and Camarac said, We go to war with fate, who has doomed that I shall not come to Carcassonne, and if we turn aside but one of the dooms of fate, then the whole future of the world is ours, and the future that fate has ordered is like the dry course of an averted river. But if such men as we, such resolute conquerors, cannot prevent one doom that fate has planned, then is the race of man enslaved for ever to do its petty and allotted task. Then they all drew their swords and waved them high in the firelight, and declared war on fate. Nothing in the somber forest stirred or made any sound. Tired men do not dream of war. When morning came over the gleaming fields, a company that had set out from Arn discovered the camping place of the warriors and brought pavilions and provender, and the warriors feasted, and the birds in the forest sang, and the inspiration of Arleon awoke. Then they rose, and following Arleon, entered the forest, and marched away to the south. And many a woman of Arn sent her thoughts with them, as they played alone some old monotonous tune. But their own thoughts were far before them, skimming over the bath, through whose deeps the river tumbles in marble Carcassonne. When butterflies were dancing on the air, and the sun neared the zenith, pavilions were pitched, and all the warriors rested, and then they feasted again, and then played nightly games, and late in the afternoon marched on once more, singing of Carcassonne. And night came down with its mystery on the forest, and gave their demoniac look again to the trees, and rolled up out of the misty hollows a huge and yellow moon. And the men of Arn lit fires, and sudden shadows arose, and leapt fantastically away, and the night wind blew, arising like a ghost, and passed between the tree trunks, and slipped down shimmering glades, and waked the prowling beasts, still dreaming of day, and drifted nocturnal birds afield to menace timorous things, and beat the roses of the befriending night, and wafted to the ears of wandering men the sound of a maiden's song, and gave a glamour to the lutenist's tune, played in his loneliness on distant hills, and the deep eyes of moths glowed like a galleon's lamps, and they spread their wings and sailed their familiar sea. Upon this night wind also the dreams of Camarac's men floated to Carcassonne.
All the next morning they marched, and all the evening, and knew they were nearing now the deeps of the forest. And the citizens of Arn kept close together and close behind the warriors, for the deeps of the forest were all unknown to travellers, but not unknown to those tales of fear that men tell at evening to their friends in the comfort and the safety of their hearths. Then night appeared, and an enormous moon, and the men of Camarac slept, Sometimes they woke and went to sleep again, and those that stayed awake for long and listened heard heavy two-footed creatures pad through the night on paws. As soon as it was light, the unarmed men of Arn began to slip away and went back by bands through the forest. When darkness came, they did not stop to sleep, but continued their flight straight on until they came to Arn, and added there by the tales they told to the terror of the forest. But the warriors feasted, and afterwards Arleon rose and played his harp and led them on again, and a few faithful servants stayed with them still. And they marched all day through a gloom that was as old as night. But Arleon's inspiration burned in his mind like a star. And he led them till the birds began to drop into the treetops. And it was evening, and they all encamped. They had only one pavilion left to them now, and near it, They lit a fire, and Camarac posted a sentry with drawn sword just beyond the glow of the firelight. Some of the warriors slept in the pavilion, and others round about it. When dawn came, something terrible had killed and eaten the sentry. But the splendor of the rumors of Carcassonne and fate's decree that they should never come there and the inspiration of Arleon and his harp all urged the warriors on and they marched deeper and deeper all day into the forest. Once they saw a dragon that had caught a bear and was playing with it, letting it run a little way and overtaking it with a paw. They came at last to a clear space in the forest just before nightfall. An odor of flowers arose from it like a mist, and every drop of dew interpreted heaven unto itself. It was the hour when twilight kisses earth. It was the hour when a meaning comes into senseless things, and trees out majesty the pomp of monarchs, and the timid creatures steal abroad to feed, and as yet the beasts of prey harmlessly dream, and earth utters a sigh, and it is night. In the midst of the wide clearing, Camarac's warriors camped, and rejoiced to see stars again appearing one by one. That night they ate the last of their provisions, and slept unmolested by the prowling things that haunt the gloom of the forest. On the next day some of the warriors hunted stags, and others lay in rushes by a neighboring lake and shot arrows at waterfowl. One stag was killed, and some geese, and several teal. Here the adventurers stayed, breathing the pure wild air that cities know not. By day they hunted, and lit fires by night, and sang and feasted, and forgot Carcassonne. The terrible denizens of the gloom never molested them. Venison was plentiful, and all manner of waterfowl. They loved the chase by day, and by night their favorite songs. Thus day after day went by, thus week after week, time flung over this encampment a handful of moons, the gold and silver moons that waste the year away. 
autumn and winter passed, and spring appeared, and still the warriors hunted and feasted there. One night of the springtide they were feasting about a fire, and telling tales of the chase, and the soft moths came out of the dark, and flaunted their colours in the firelight, and went out grey into the dark again. And the night wind was cool upon the warriors' necks, and the campfire was warm in their faces, and a silence had settled among them after some song, and Arleon all at once rose suddenly up, remembering Carcasson, and his hand swept over the strings of his harp, awakening deeper chords, like the sound of a nimble people dancing their steps on bronze, and the music rolled away into the night's own silence, and the voice of Arleon arose. When there is blood in the bath, she knows there is war in the mountains, and longs for the battle shout of kingly men. And suddenly all shouted, Carcassonne! And at that word their idleness was gone, as a dream is gone, from a dreamer waked with a shout. And soon the great march began that faltered no more, nor wavered, unchecked by battles, undaunted in lonesome spaces, ever unwearied by the vulturous years, the warriors of Camarac held on, and Arleon's inspiration led them still. They cleft with the music of Arleon's harp the gloom of ancient silences, They went singing into battles with terrible wild men, and came out singing but with fewer voices. They came to villages in valleys full of the music of bells, or saw the lights at dusk of cottages sheltering others. They became a proverb for wandering, and a legend arose of strange, disconsolate men. Folks spoke of them at nightfall, when the fire was warm, and rain slipped down the eaves, and when the wind was high, small children feared the men who would not rest were going clattering past. Strange tales were told of men in old grey armour, moving at twilight along the tops of the hills, and never asking shelter, and mothers told their boys, who grew impatient of home, that the grey wanderers were once so impatient, and were now hopeless of rest, and were driven along with the rain whenever the wind was angry. But the wanderers were cheered in their wandering by the hope of coming to Carcassonne, and later on by anger against fate, and at last they marched on still because it seemed better to march on than to think. For many years they had wandered and had fought with many tribes, Often they gathered legends in villages and listened to idle singers singing songs, and all the rumours of Carcassonne still came from the south. And then one day they came to a hilly land with a legend in it that only three valleys away a man might see on clear days Carcassonne. Tired though they were and few, and worn with the years which had all brought them wars, they pushed on instantly, led still by Arleon's inspiration, which dwindled in his age, though he made music with his old harp still. All day they climbed down into the first valley, and for two days ascended, and came to the town that may not be taken in war, below the top of the mountain, and its gates were shut against them, and there was no way round. To left and right, steep precipices stood, for as far as I could see, or legend tell of. 
and the pass lay through the city. Therefore Camarac drew up his remaining warriors in line of battle to wage their last war, and they stepped forward over the crisp bones of old unburied armies. No sentinel defied them in the gate, no arrow flew from any tower of war. One citizen climbed alone to the mountain's top, and the rest hid themselves in sheltered places. Now in the top of the mountain was a deep, bowl-like cavern in the rock in which fires bubbled softly. But if any cast a boulder into the fires, as it was the custom for one of the citizens to do when enemies approached them, the mountain hurled up intermittent rocks for three days, and the rocks fell flaming all over the town and all round about it. And just as Camarac's men began to batter the gate, they heard a crash on the mountain, and a great rock fell beyond them and rolled into the valley. The next two fell in front of them on the iron roofs of the town. Just as they entered the town, a rock found them crowded in a narrow street and shattered two of them. The mountain smoked and panted. With every pant, a rock plunged into the streets or bounced along the heavy iron roof, and the smoke went slowly up and up and up. When they had come through the long town's empty streets to the locked gate at the end, only fifteen were left. When they had broken down the gate, there were only ten alive. Three more were killed as they went up the slope, and two as they passed near the terrible cavern. Fate let the rest go some way down the mountain upon the other side, and then took three of them. Camarac and Arleon alone were left alive, and night came down on the valley to which they had come, and was lit by flashes from the fatal mountain and the two mourned for their comrades all night long. But when the morning came, they remembered their war with fate, and their old resolve to come to Carcassonne. And the voice of Arleon rose in a quavering song, and snatches of music from his old harp, and he stood up and marched with his face southwards, as he had done for years, and behind him, Camarac went, and when at last they climbed from the third valley and stood on the hill's summit in the golden sunlight of evening, their aged eyes saw only miles of forest and the birds going to roost. Their beards were white, and they had travelled very far and hard. It was the time with them when a man rests from labours and dreams in light sleep of the years that were and not of the years to come. Long they looked southwards, and the sun set over remoter forests, and glowworms lit their lamps, and the inspiration of Arleon rose and flew away forever, to gladden, perhaps, the dreams of younger men. And Arleon said, My king, I know no longer the way to Carcassonne. And Camarac smiled as the aged smile, with little cause for mirth, and said, The years are going before us, like huge birds, whom doom and destiny and the schemes of God have frightened up out of some old grey marsh. And it may well be that against these no warrior may avail, and that fate has conquered us, and that our quest has failed. And after this they were silent. Then they drew their swords, and side by side went down into the forest, still seeking Carcassonne. I think they got not far, for there were deadly marshes in that forest, and gloom that outlasted the nights, and fearful beasts accustomed to its ways. Neither is there any legend, either in verse or among the songs of the people of the fields, of any having come 
to Carcassonne. End of Carcassonne by Lord Dunsany. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Davy Jones' Gift by John Maysfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Davy Jones' Gift by John Maysfield. Once upon a time, said the sailor, the devil and Davy Jones came to Cardiff, to a place called Tiger Bay. They put up at Tony Adams, not far from Pierhead, at the corner of Sunday Lane. And all the time they stayed there, they used to be going to the rum shop where they sat at a table, smoking their cigars, and dicing each other for different persons' souls. Now you must know that the devil gets landsmen, and Davy Jones gets sailor folk, and they get tired of having always the same. So then they diced each other for some of the other sort. One time they were in a place in Mary Street, having some burnt brandy and playing red and black for the people passing. And while they were looking out on the street and turning the cards, they saw all the people on the sidewalk breaking their necks to get into the gutter, and they saw all the shop people running out and kowtowing, and all the carts pulling up and all the police saluting. "'Here comes the big knob,' said Davy Jones. "'Yes,' said the devil. "'It's the bishop that's stopping with the mayor.' "'Red or black,' said Davy Jones, picking up a card. "'I don't play for bishops,' said the devil. "'I respect the cloth,' he said. "'Come on, man,' said Davy Jones. "'I'd give an admiral for a bishop. "'Come on now, make your game.' red or black well i say red said the devil it's the ace of clubs said davy jones i win and it's the first bishop i've ever had in my life the devil was mighty angry at that at losing a bishop i'll not play any more he said i'm off home some people gets too good cards for me there was some queer shuffling when the pack was cut, that's my belief. Ah, stay and be friends, man, said Davy Jones. Look at what's coming down the street. I'll give you that for nothing. Now coming down the street was a reefer, one of those apprentice fellows. And he was brass-bound fit to play music. He stood about six feet, and there were bright brass buttons down his jacket and on his collar and on his sleeves his cap had a big gold badge with the house flag in seven different colors in the middle of it and a gold chain cable of chinsay twisted around it he was wearing his cap on three hairs and he was walking on both the sidewalks and all the road his trousers were cut like wind sails round his ankles he had a fathom of red silk tie rolling out over his chest. He had a cigarette in a twisted clay holder a foot and a half long. He was chewing tobacco over his shoulder as he walked. He'd a bottle of rum hot in one hand and a bag of jam tarts in the other, and his pockets were full of love letters from every port between Rio and Calio round by the east. "'You mean to say you'll give me that?' said the devil. I will, said Davy Jones, and a beauty he is. I've never seen a finer. He is indeed a beauty, said the devil. I take back what I said about the cards. I'm sorry I spoke crusty. What's the matter with some burnt brandy? Brandy be it, said Davy Jones. So then they rang the bell and ordered a new jug and clean glasses. Now the devil was so proud of what Davy Jones had given him he couldn't keep away from him. He used to hang around the East Butte docks under the red brick clock tower looking at the bark the young men worked aboard. Bill Harker his name was. He was in the West Coast Bark, the Colonel, loading fuel for Hilo. So at last, when the Colonel was sailing, the devil shipped himself a boarder 
as one of the crowd in the forecastle, and away they went down the channel. At first he was very happy, for Bill Harker was in the same watch, and the two would yarn together. And though he was wise when he shipped, Bill Harker taught him a lot. There was a lot of things Bill Harker knew about. But when they were off the river plate, they got caught in a pampero, and it blew very hard, and a big green sea began to run. The colonel was a wet ship, and for three days you could stand upon her poop, and look forward and see nothing but a smother of foam from the break over the poop to the jib boom. The crew had to roost on the poop. The forecastle was flooded out. So while they were like this, the flying jib worked loose. The jib will be gone in half a tick, said the mate. Out over there, one of you, and make it fast before it blows away. But the boom was dipping under every minute, and the waist was four feet deep, and the green water came about all along her length. So none of the crowd would go forward. Then Bill Harker stumbled out, and away he went forward, with the green seas smashing over him, and he lay out along the jib boom and made the sail fast, and jolly near drowned he was. That's a brave fellow, that Bill Harker, said the devil. Ah, come on, said the sailors. Them reefers, they ain't got no soul to be saved. It was that that set the devil thinking. By and by they came up with the horn, and if it had blown off the plate, it now blew off the roof. Talk about wind and weather. They got em both for shore aboard the colonel, and it blew all the sails off her, and she rolled all her masts out, and the sea made a breach of her bulwarks, and the ice knocked a hole in her bows. So watch and watch they pumped the old colonel, and the leak gained steadily, and they were hove under a weather cloth, five and a half degrees to the south of anything. And while they were like this, just about giving up hope, the old man sent a watch below, and told them they should start prayers. So the devil crept on to the top of the half-deck, to look through the scuttle, to see what the reefers were doing, and what kind of prayers Bill Harker was putting up. And he saw them all sitting around a table, under a lamp, with Bill Harker at the head. And each of them had a hand of cards, and a length of knotted rope yarn, and they were playing Abel Whackets. Each man in turn put down a card and swore a new blasphemy, and if his swear didn't come out as he played the card, then all the others hit him with their teasers. And they never once had a chance to hit Bill Harker. I think they were right about his soul, said the devil. He sighed like he was sad. Shortly after, the colonel went down, and all hands drowned in her, saving only Bill Harker and the devil. They came up out of the smothering green sea, and saw the stars blinking in the sky, and heard the wind howling like a pack of dogs. They managed to get aboard the colonel's henhouse, which had come adrift, and floated. The fowls were all drowned inside, so they lived on drowned hens. As for drink, they had to do without, for there was none. When they got thirsty, they splashed their faces with salt water but they were so cold they didn't feel thirst very bad. They drifted three days and three nights, till their skins were all cracked and salt-caked. And all the devil thought of was whether Bill Harker had a soul. And Bill kept telling the devil what a thundering big feed they would have as soon as they fetched to port, and how good a rum hot would be, and a lump of sugar, and a bit of lemon peel. And at last the old henhouse came bumping on to Tierra del Fuego, and there were some natives cooking rabbits. So the devil and Bill made a raid of the whole jing-bang, and ate till they were tired. Then they had a drink out of a brook, and a warm by the fire, and a pleasant sleep. Now, said the devil, I'll see if he's got a soul. I'll see if he gives thanks. So after an hour or two, Bill took a turn up, and down, and came to the devil. It's mighty dull on this forgotten continent, he said. Have you got a haypenny? No, said the devil. What in joy do you want with a haypenny? 
I might have played you pitch and toss, said Bill. I give up, said the devil. You've no more soul than the inner part of an empty barrel. And with that the devil vanished in a flame of sulphur. Bill stretched himself and put another shrub on the fire. He picked up a few round shells and began a game of knuckle bones. The End of Davy Jones' Gift by John Maysfield The Dream Muff by Marjorie Werner Reed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Dream Muff to I. K. McF. One more day of horror had ended for Russia. At this hour, once the lamps along the Neva would have been lighted, the laughter of sleigh riders would have resounded over the snow. But now the streets were dark, deserted save by some wandering homeless people seeking refuge in the night. No one seemed to know exactly what had happened or the cause. There was no ruler, no order, darkness, and chaos. A girl, perhaps of twelve, sat huddled in a ragged shawl on the steps of a closed church. There had been a time when a fire burned. A mother, a father, brothers, they had gone. No one knew where. The mother was a royalist. She used to sew for a great lady, a princess. Perhaps the jailers of a prison could tell where she was. Once, in the life that was only a memory, was it real, or was the biting cold, was the hunger what had always been? Her mother had taken her to the house of the great lady. Her eyes had opened in childish wonder as the princess took her from room to room. On a great couch of palest blue, among cushions that were all lace and blue and pink, a muff. It had been carelessly thrown down. She had loved it. Her greatest desire had been to touch it, to feel the soft gray fur on her face. A piercing wind blew from the frozen river. The muff, if it would come, it would keep her warm. She would put her hand in it and hold it to her heart. Through half-closed lids, she saw the muff curving and swaying in the air, like a gray bird. It was looking for her. There were so many freezing children in the streets. She was small for her age. How warm, how kind of the princess to send the muff. Maybe mother will soon be home from work. We can have supper. Boris will come home from school. But Boris lay dying, prisoner in the enemy's land. When a pale sun struggled to light down on the dirty streets, on the confusion and sorrow of that Russian city, an old priest, dying with all the rest of sorrow for his land, found the frozen body of a little girl, with hands clasped over her heart, a faint smile on her upturned face. End of The Dream Muff by Marjorie Werner Reed This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hankinson's Perfect Crime by Ward Sterling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Hankinson's Perfect Crime by Ward Sterling Having decided to kill Chester O'Hearn, Hankinson commenced making his plans. He had often read of the perfect crime, the foolproof crime to which there is no clue, but which always ends disastrously for the perpetrator, because of some straggling little thread left untied. In his case, there would be no slip-up. The average murderer, he believed, killed on impulse. Few, if any, went about it as he was doing, weighing every minor detail, covering every track as he proceeded carefully, for he felt that he had months ahead of him in which to complete his arrangements. He went over every possible contingency. Every method of killing known to civilized man was carefully jotted down. Newspaper clippings related to crime were card indexed and filed away for future reference. When he had secured all the information he desired, he sat down, spread the various data before him, and dissected them bit by bit. 
This work completed, he tabulated the results carefully, then rejected the whole. The crimes of others served him as an object lesson in what to avoid. There were two pitfalls to be watched for. One was the fact that O'Hearn was carrying on a liaison with Mrs. Hankinson. In spite of their efforts to avoid scandal, several people of their acquaintance knew which way the straws were blowing, and one or two had hinted at the facts to the husband. And O'Hearn was a man of great wealth, and Hankinson's cousin. Hankinson, upon his death, would inherit the greater part of his millions. Therefore, any suspicion of murder would cause people to look naturally in Hankinson's direction. Therefore, there must be no suspicion of murder. To kill O'Hearn and have it appear as a suicide would never do either. People always talked too much about suicide and inquired into the whys and wherefores. Talking might cause some blundering officer to accidentally guess at the truth. After debating the matter thoroughly in his own mind, he finally decided that there was but one solution to the problem. First, O'Hearn must be killed in such a way that it would look like an accident. Second, when the killing took place, Hankinson must be close by, but not actually present. Third, others must be witnesses to the tragedy. There must be enough witnesses to prove conclusively that an accident had been the cause of death, and they must be men and women whose testimony would be accepted without question of doubt in any court of the land. These things having been decided upon, Hankinson had next to select a method of committing the deed. O'Hearn was an ardent sportsman, hunter, and trap shooter. What, then, would be more natural than that he should be killed in the field and by his own gun? But how? It took Hankinson several weeks to decide this point. Here, as before, details were mentally discussed, catalogued, and discarded. The solution was finally reached through the application of chemistry, and, having arrived at a decision, Hankinson applied himself vigorously, and with his usual painstaking thoroughness, to the task of putting the affair through to a successful conclusion. In an obscure drug store in another city, he purchased a small bottle of nitric acid. Several weeks later he motored to the metropolis, a hundred miles distant in order to secure fifteen cents worth of sulfuric acid. Laying both purchases aside, he waited several weeks, finally finding occasion to make a trip to a third town, where he bought a bottle of glycerin. He now had the ingredients to manufacture enough nitroglycerin to blow up a regiment, all purchased in such a way that suspicion could never be traced to him. But he was wary. The time was not yet ripe. There was always a chance that some over-alert clerk might, through some unforeseen circumstance, remember his face and connect him with the purchase of one of the chemicals. It was best to wait until the memory of his small purchases faded from their minds. It was lack of attention to such small details that had caused others to be caught. In his case, nothing was too tiny to be overlooked. He was a brain that could foresee all contingencies. Six weeks passed before he was ready to act. One day, while visiting O'Hearn's bachelor apartments, he managed to pocket half a dozen shells such as his cousin used in his favorite gun. Again, he waited for weeks to see if the theft was noticed. Finding that it was not, he proceeded to carefully draw the wads from three of the shells uncrimping the edges in such a way that it would not be noticed. He even wore gloves to avoid tell-tale fingerprints. Pouring out the charges of powder and shot, he poured into the empty shells enough nitroglycerin, which he compounded from his chemicals, to make small bombs out of each, replaced the waddings, and, turning back the edges carefully, he looked over his handiwork. To all appearances, the shells were identical to their mates. Yet, when the hammer struck the cap, it would create an explosion sufficient to tear the very head off the unfortunate O'Hearn. 
a terrific jar would explode the other shells and the remaining evidence would be destroyed naturally as hankinson knew there would be an inquiry but as a method of committing murder it was so unique that it would never be suspected instead the company which manufactured the cartridges would be blamed accidents were always likely to happen in powder factories in the end the coroner's jury would decide that something had gone wrong with the formula when the powder was made he as o'hearn's next of kin would bring suit against the manufacturers and the latter for their own protection would settle as speedily as possible in order to avoid unnecessary publicity he poured the acid and glycerin down the sewer the bottles in which the chemicals came he broke into small pieces and buried in the ashes thus he covered his tracks as he went along the hunting season opened next day he and o'hearn had made all arrangements to leave early in the morning for a forenoon spurt among the ducks a large party of friends was to accompany them the friends were to be the necessary witnesses waiting until late in the evening he hastened to o'hearn's rooms a matter of business would he stated keep him in town for an hour or two after the party had started as soon as he could conveniently get away he would motor out to the club grounds and join the others o'hearn was examining his hunting gear and filled the pockets of his coat with cartridges as hankinson knew he would waiting until the other had left the room for a second he removed three of the shells from the front right hand pocket dropping into their place the three filled with the deadly nitroglycerin he knew o'hearn's habits at the club grounds the sportsmen would divide into small parties each picking out his individual blind most of them would go in parties of twos with hankinson absent o'hearn would occupy a blind alone until his partner's arrival with the ducks flying thick one of the three fixed cartridges would surely be fired inside the first half hour by the time he arrived the others would be on their way back carrying with them the mangled remains of chester o'hearn two someone has remarked that it is the little things that affect human destinies in this case it was a small leak in a rubber boot that saved chester o'hearn's life and prevented carl hankinson from committing the perfect crime o'hearn had suffered from a slight cold arriving at the clubhouse he no sooner set foot on the ground than he accidentally stepped into a tiny pool of water an instant later he discovered the leak in his boot there were no other boots available and to enter the blind with those he wore meant to invite illness never of robust constitution he feared to take a chance as a result he sat on a log along the bank of the river his dog by his side watching the others fill their bags the morning turned out to be warmer than usual finding his heavy canvas hunting coat its pockets loaded down with shells too heavy over his thick sweater o'hearn divested himself of it and lay it on the grass close by stretching out he filled his pipe and took matters as philosophically as could be expected of an enthusiastic sportsman forced to keep out of the game at the opening of the hunting season and the ducks thicker than ever before in history meanwhile hankinson driving slowly reached the grounds looking around carefully he was astonished to find no evidence of the tragedy where there should have been a white-faced little group of men standing around a blanket covered form all of the members of the party as far as he could see were busily engaged in banging away at the feathered game he hesitated for an instant it would never do to go back now that he had come this far anyone might have seen him the accident was certain to happen shortly to turn back now would be the equivalent of admitting guilty knowledge nor would he dare enter the blind with o'hearn for when one of the doctored shells exploded anyone within a radius of a dozen feet would be in danger 
moving slowly, trying to think of some excuse to keep out of the other's company, he rounded a curve in the pathway. He was almost upon O'Hearn before he noticed the other sprawled upon the river bank, half asleep. 3. Dogs are affectionate animals. The one owned by O'Hearn was no exception to the rule. Forced to remain with its master, when the other canines of the party were enjoying a full day's sport, it longed for a romp. Hankinson had often played with it in times gone past. Recognizing its friend, it leapt to its feet and, tail waving, darted toward him. Hankinson's gun was in his hand. It was this that probably caused a streak of peculiar dog reasoning to flash through the animal's brain. Here, he probably thought to himself, is why my master has been waiting. Now that he's arrived, let's get started. Seizing O'Hearn's hunting coat in his mouth, the animal leapt towards Hankinson, the heavily loaded pockets of the coat swinging wildly. As it fawned upon the newcomer, one of the loaded pockets struck the butt of Hankinson's shotgun. Nitroglycerin explodes upon concussion. The End of Hankinson's Perfect Crime by Ward Sterling In Berlin by Mary Boyle O'Reilly This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman In Berlin by Mary Boyle O'Reilly The train crawling out of Berlin was filled with women and children, hardly an able-bodied man. In one compartment, a gray-haired Landstrom soldier sat beside an elderly woman who seemed weak and ill. Above the click-clack of the car wheels, passengers could hear her counting. One, two, three, evidently absorbed in her own thoughts. Sometimes she repeated the words at short intervals. Two girls tittered thoughtlessly, exchanging vapid remarks about such extraordinary behavior. An elderly man scowled reprovingly. Silence fell. One, two, three repeated the obviously unconscious woman. Again the girls giggled stupidly. The gray Landstrom leaned forward. Fräulein, he said gravely, you will perhaps cease laughing when I tell you that this poor lady is my wife. We have just lost our three sons in battle. Before leaving for the front myself, I must take their mother to an insane asylum. It became terribly quiet in the carriage. The End of In Berlin by Mary Boyle O'Reilly The Magic Cask by Richard Wilhelm Translated by Frederick H. Martins This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Magic Cask Once upon a time there was a man who dug up a big earthenware cask in his field, so he took it home with him and told his wife to clean it out. But when his wife started brushing the inside of the cask, the cask suddenly began to fill itself with brushes. No matter how many were taken out, others kept on taking their place. So the man sold the brushes, and the family managed to live quite comfortably. Once a coin fell into the cask by mistake. At once the brushes disappeared, and the cask began to fill itself with money. So now the family became rich, for they could take as much money out of the cask as ever they wished. Now the man had an old grandfather at home who was weak and shaky, 
since there was nothing else he could do, his grandson set him to work shoveling money out of the cask, and when the old grandfather grew weary and could not keep on, he would fall into a rage and shout at him angrily, telling him he was lazy and did not want to work. One day, however, the old man's strength gave out, and he fell into the cask and died. At once the money disappeared, and the whole cask began to fill itself with dead grandfathers. Then the man had to pull them all out and have them buried, and for this purpose he had to use up again all the money he had received. And when he was through, the cask broke, and he was just as poor as before. End of the Magic Cask by Richard Wilhelm Translated by Frederick H. Martins This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Marching Morons by C. M. Cornbluth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. The Marching Morons, Part 1, by C. M. Cornbluth. In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man, of course, is king. But how about a live wire, a smart businessman, and a civilization of 100% pure chumps? Some things had not changed. A potter's wheel was still a potter's wheel and clay was still clay. F. M. Hawkins had built his shop near Goose Lake, which had a narrow band of good, fat clay and a narrow beach of white sand. He fired three bottle-nosed kilns with willow charcoal from the woodlot. The woodlot was also useful for long walks while the kilns were cooling. If he let himself stay within sight of them, he would open them prematurely, impatient to see how some new shape or glaze had come through the fire, and ping, the new shape or glaze would be good for nothing but the shard pile back of his slip tanks. A business conference was in full swing in his shop, a modest cube of brick, tile-roofed as the Chicago-Los Angeles rocket thundered overhead, very noisy, very swept back, very fiery jets, shaped as sleekly swift-looking as an airborne barracuda. The buyer from Marshall Fields was turning over a black-glazed one-liter carafe, nodding approval with his massive, handsome head. "'This is real purdy,' he told Hawkins and his own secretary, Gomez Laplace. "'This has got lots of what you call real aesthetic principles. Yeah, it is real purdy.' How much? the secretary asked the potter. Seven fifty each in dozen lots, said Hawkins. I ran up fifteen dozen last month. They are real aesthetic, repeated the buyer from Fields. I will take them all. I don't think you can do that, doctor, said the secretary. Bid cost us one thousand three hundred and fifty. That would leave only five hundred and thirty two dollars in our quarter's budget and we still have to run down to East Liverpool to pick up some cheap dinner sets. Dinner sets? asked the buyer, his big face full of wonder. Dinner sets? The department has been out of them for two months now. Mr. Garvey Seabright got pretty nasty about it yesterday, remember? Garvey Seabright, that meat-headed blue nose, the buyer said contemptuously, he don't know nothing about aesthetics. Why for? Don't he let me run my own department? His eye fell upon a stray copy of Wambo Zambo comics, and he sat down with it. An occasional deep chuckle or grunt of surprise escaped him as he turned the pages. Uninterrupted, the potter and the buyer secretary quickly closed a deal for two dozen of the leader carafes. I wish we could take more, said the secretary, but you heard what I told him. We've had to turn away customers for ordinary dinnerware because he shot the last quarter's budget on some Mexican piggy banks some equally enthusiastic importer stuck him with. The fifth floor is packed solid with them. 
I bet they look mighty aesthetic. They're painted with purple cacti. The potter shuddered and caressed the glaze of the sample carafe. The buyer looked up and rumbled, Ain't you dummies through yakking yet? What the good's a secretary for if he don't take the burden of detail off in my back, yer? We're all through, doctor. Are you ready to go? The buyer grunted peevishly, dropped Wembo Zambo comics on the floor, and led the way out of the building and down the long corduroy road to the highway. His car was waiting on the concrete. It was, like all contemporary cars, too low slung to get over the logs. He climbed down into the car and started the motor with a tremendous sparkle and roar. Gomez Laplace, called out the potter under the cover of noise, did anything come of the radiation program they were working on the last time I was on duty at the pole? Same old fallacy, said the secretary gloomily. It stopped us on mutation, it stopped us on culling, it stopped us on segregation, and now it stopped us on hypnosis. Well, I'm scheduled back to the grind in nine days. Time for another firing right now. I've got a new luster to try. I'll miss you. I shall be vacationing, running the drafting room of the New Century Engineering Corporation in Denver. They're going to put up a 200-story office building, and naturally somebody's got to be on hand. Naturally, said Hawkins with his sour smile. There was an ear-piercingly sweet blast as the buyer leaned on the horn button. Also a yard-tall jet of what looked like flame spurted up from the car's radiator cap. The car's power plant was gas turbine and had no radiator. I'm coming, doctor, said the secretary dispiritedly. He climbed down into the car, and it whooshed off with much flame and noise. The potter, depressed, wandered back up the corduroy road and contemplated his cooling kilns. The rustling wind in the boughs was obscuring the creak and mutter of the shrinking refractory brick. Hawkins wondered about the number two kiln, a reduction fire on a load of lusterware mugs. Had the clay chinking excluded the air? Had it been a properly smoky blaze? Would it do any harm if he just took one close? Common sense took Hawkins by the scruff of the neck and yanked him over to the tool shed. He got out his pick and resolutely set off on a prospecting jaunt to a hummocky field that might yield some oxides. He was especially low on coppers. The long walk left him sweating hard. With his lust for a peek into the kiln quiet in his breast, he swung his pick almost at random into one of the hammocks. It clanged on a stone, which he excavated. A largely obliterated inscription said, Ursity of Chick, a logical labo, eleven memory of, killed in act. The potter swore mildly. He had hoped the field would turn out to be a cemetery, preferably a once fashionable cemetery full of once massive bronze caskets moldered into oxides of tin and copper. Well, hell. Maybe there was some around anyway. He headed lackadaisically for the second largest hillock and sliced into it with his pick. There was a stone to undercut and topple unto a trench, and then the potter was very glad he had stuck at it. His nostrils were filled with a bitter smell, and the dirt was tinged with the exciting blue of copper salts. The pick went clang. Hawkins, puffing, pried up a stainless steel plate it was quite badly stained, and was also marked with incised letters. It seemed to have pulled loose from rotting bronze. There were rivets on the back that brought up flakes of green patina. The potter wiped off the surface dirt with his sleeve, turned it to catch the sunlight obliquely, and read, Honest John Barlow. Honest John, famed in university annals, represents a challenge which medical science has not yet answered. Revival of a human being accidentally thrown into a state of suspended animation. In 1988, Mr. Barlow, a leading Evanston real estate dealer, 
visited his dentist for treatment of an impacted wisdom tooth. His dentist requested and received permission to use the experimental anesthetic cyclopyridimethanol B7, developed at the university. After administration of the anesthetic, the dentist resorted to his drill, and by freakish mischance, a short circuit in his machine delivered 220 volts of 60 cycle current into the patient. In a damage suit instituted by Mrs. Barlow against the dentist, the university, and the makers of the drill, a jury found for the defendants. Mr. Barlow never got up from the dentist's chair, and was assumed to have died of poisoning, electrocution, or both. Morticians preparing him for embalming discovered, however, that their subject was, though certainly not living, just as certainly not dead. The university was notified, and a series of exhaustive tests was begun, including attempts to duplicate the trans state on volunteers. After a bad run of seven cases, which ended fatally, the attempts were abandoned. Honest John was long an exhibit at the University Museum, and livened many a football game as mascot of the university's blue crushers. The bounds of taste were overstepped, however, when a pledge to Sigma Delta Chi was ordered in O three to kidnap Honest John from his loosely guarded glass museum case and introduce him into the Rachel Swanson Memorial Girls' Gymnasium Shower Room. On May 22, 2003, the University Board of Regents issued the following order. By unanimous vote, it is directed that the remains of Honest John Barlow be removed from the University Museum and conveyed to the University's Lieutenant James Scott III Memorial Biological Laboratories, and there be securely locked in a specially prepared vault. It is further directed that all possible measures for the preservation of these remains be taken by the laboratory administration, and that access to these remains be denied to all persons except qualified scholars authorized in writing by the board. The board reluctantly takes this action in view of recent notices and photographs in the nation's press, which, to say the least, reflect but small credit upon the university. It was far from his field, but Hawkins understood what had happened. An early and accidental blundering into the bare bones of the eleventh man shock anesthesia, which had since been replaced by other methods. To bring subjects out of eleventh man shock, you let them have a squirt of simple saline in the trigeminal nerve. Interesting. And how about that bronze? He heaved the pick into the rotting green salts, expecting no resistance and almost fractured his wrist. Something down there was solid. He began to flake off the oxides. A half hour of work brought him down to phosphor bronze, a huge casting of the almost incorruptible metal. It had weakened structurally over the centuries. He could fit the point of his pick under a corroded boss and pry off great creaky and grumbling stria of the stuff. Hawkins wished he had an archaeologist with him, but he didn't dream of returning to his shop and calling one to take over the find. He was an all-round man, by choice and in his free time an artist in clay and glaze, by necessity an automotive, electronics, and atomic engineer, who could also swing a project in traffic control, individual and group psychology, architecture, or tool design. He didn't yell for a specialist every time something out of his line came up. There were so few with so much to do. He trenched around his find, discovering that it was a great brick-shaped bronze mass with an exceedingly hollow sound. A long strip of moldering metal from one of their long vertical faces pulled away, exposing red rust that went whoosh and was sucked into the interior of the mass. It had been de-aired, thought Hawkins, and there must have been an inner jacket of glass which had crystallized through the centuries and quietly crumbled at the first clang of his pick. He didn't know what a vacuum would do to a subject of Levitman chalk, but he had hopes, 
nor did he quite understand what a real estate dealer was, but it might have something to do with pottery, and anything might have a bearing on topic number one. He flung his pick out of the trench, climbed out and set off at a dog-trot for his shop. A little rummaging around turned up a hypo, and there was a plastic container of salt in the kitchen. Back at his dig, he chipped for another half-hour to expose the juncture of lid and body. The hinges were hopeless. He smashed them off. Hawkins extended the telescopic handle of the pick for the best leverage, fitted its point into a deep pit, set its built-in fulcrum, and heaved. Five more heaves, and he could see, inside the vault, what looked like a dusty marble statue. Ten more, and he could see that it was the naked body of Honest John Barlow, Evanston, real estate dealer, uncorrupted by time. The potter found the apex of the trigeminal nerve with his needle's point, and gave him sixty cc. In an hour, Barlow's chest began to pump. In another hour, he rasped. Did it work? Did it? <laughs> muttered Hawkins. Barlow opened his eyes and stirred, looked down, turned his hands before his eyes. I'll sue, he screamed. My clothes, my fingernails. A horrid suspicion came over his face, and he clapped his hands to his hairless scalp. My hair, he wailed. I'll sue you for every penny you've got. That release won't mean a damn thing in court. I didn't sign away my hair and clothes and fingernails. They'll grow back, said Hawkins casually. Also your epidermis. Those parts of you weren't alive, you know, so they weren't preserved like the rest of you. I'm afraid the clothes are gone, though. What is this? The university hospital? demanded Barlow. I want a phone. No, you phone. Tell my wife I'm all right, and tell Sam Immerman, he's my lawyer, to get over here right away. Greenleaf 74022. Ow! He had tried to set up, and a portion of his pink skin rubbed against the inner surface of the casket, which was powdered by the ancient crystallized glass. What the hell did you guys do? Boil me alive? Oh, you're going to pay for this. Well, you're all right, said Hawkins, wishing now he had a reference book to clear up several obscure terms. Your epidermis will start growing immediately. You're not in the hospital. Look here. He handed Barlow the stainless steel plate that had labeled the casket. After a suspicious glance, the man started to read. Finishing, he laid the plate carefully on the edge of the vault and was silent for a spell. Poor Verna, he said at last. It doesn't say whether she was stuck with the court costs. Do you happen to know? No, said the potter. All I know is what was on the plate and how to revive you. The dentist accidentally gave you a dose of what we call Levitman shock anesthesia. We haven't used it for centuries. It was powerful, but too dangerous. Centuries, brooded the man. Centuries? I'll bet Sam swindled her out of her eye teeth. Poor Verna. How long ago was it? What year is this? And Hawkins shrugged. We call it. 7-B-936. That's no help to you. It takes a long time for these metals to oxidize. Like that movie, Marlowe muttered. Who would have thought it? Poor Verna. He blubbered and sniffled, reminding Hawkins powerfully of the fact that he had been found under a flat rock. Almost angrily, the potter demanded, How many children did you have? None yet, sniffled Barlow. My first wife di didn't want them, but Verna wants one, wanted one, but we're going to wait until, we were going to wait until, of course, said the potter, feeling a savage desire to tell him off, blast him to hell and gone for his work, but he choked it down. There was the problem to think of. There was always the problem to think of, and this poor blubberer might unexpectedly supply a clue. Hawkins would have to pass him on. Come along, Hawkins said. My time is short. Barlow stood up, outraged. 
how can you be so unfeeling i'm a human being like the los angeles chicago rocket thundered overhead and barlow broke off in mid-complaint beautiful he breathed following it with his eyes beautiful he climbed out of the vault too interested to be pained by its roughness against his infantile skin after all he said briskly this should have its sunny side i was never much for reading but this is just like one of the stories and i ought to make some money out of it shouldn't i he gave hawkins a shrewd glance you want money asked the potter here he handed over a fistful of change and bills you'd better put my shoes on it'll be about a quarter mile oh and you're a modest yes that was the word here and hawkins gave him his pants but barlow was excitedly counting the money eighty-five eighty-six and it's dollars too i thought it'd be credits or whatever they call em e pluribus unum and liberty just different faces say is there a catch to this are these real genuine honest twenty-two cent dollars like we had or just wallpaper they're quite all right i assure you said the potter i wish you'd come along i'm in a hurry the man babbled as they stumped toward the shop where are we going the council of scientists the world coordinator or something like that who oh no we call them president and congress no that wouldn't do any good at all i'm just taking you to see some people i ought to make plenty out of this plenty i could write books get some smart young fellow to put it into words for me and i'll bet i could turn out a best seller what's the setup on things like that oh it's about like that smart young fellows but there aren't any best sellers any more people don't read much nowadays we'll find something equally profitable for you to do back in the shop hawkins gave barlow a suit of clothes deposited him in the waiting room and called central in chicago take him away he pleaded i have time for one more firing and he blathers and blathers i haven't told him anything perhaps we should just turn him loose and let him find his own level but there's a chance the problem agreed central yes there's a chance the potter delighted barlow by taking him a cup of coffee with a cube that not only dissolved in cold water but heated the water to boiling point killing time hawkins chatted about the rocket barlow had admired and had to haul himself up short he had almost told the real estate man what its top speed really was almost indeed revealed that it was not a rocket he regretted too that he had so casually handed barlow a couple of hundred dollars the man seemed obsessed with fear that they were worthless since hawkins refused to take a note or i o u or even a definite promise of repayment but hawkins couldn't go into details and was very glad when a stranger arrived from central tinny pete from algericas the stranger told him swiftly as the two of them met at the door psychist for pop prob pull assigned special overtake barlow thank heaven said hawkins barlow he told the man from the past this is tinny pete he's going to take care of you and help you make lots of money the psychist stayed for a cup of the coffee whose preparation had delighted barlow and then conducted the real estate man down the corduroy road to his car leaving the potter to speculate whether he could at last crack his kilns hawkins abruptly dismissing barlow and the problem happily picked the chinking from around the door of the number two kiln prying it open a trifle a blast of heat and the heady smoky scent of the reduction fire delighted him he peered and saw a corner of a shelf glowing cherry red becoming obscured by wavering black areas as it lost heat through the opened door he slipped a charred wood paddle under a mug on the shelf and pulled it out as a sample the hairs on the back of his hand curling and scorching the mug crackled and pinged and hawkins sighed happily the bismuth resonate luster had fired to perfection a haunting film of silvery black metal 
with strange bluish lights in it as it turned before the eyes, and the problem of population seemed to be very far away to Hawkins then. Barlow and Tinny Pete arrived at the concrete highway where the psychist's car was parked in a safety bay. What a boat! gasped the man from the past. Boat? No, that's my car. Barlow surveyed it with awe, swept back lines, deep-drawn compound curves, kilograms of comb. He ran his hands futilely over the door, or was it the door, in a futile search for a handle, and asked respectfully, How fast does it go? The psychist gave him a keen look, and said slowly, Two hundred and fifty. You can tell by this speedometer. Wow! My old Chevy could hit a hundred on a straightaway, but you're out of my class, mister. Tenny Pete somehow got a huge low door open, and Barlow descended three steps into immense cushions floundering over to the right. He was too fascinated to pay serious attention to his flayed dermis. The dashboard was a lovely wilderness of dials, plugs, indicators, lights, scales, and switches. The psychist climbed down into the driver's seat and did something with his feet. The motor started like lighting a blowtorch as big as a silo. Wallowing around in the cushions, Barlow saw through a rear-view mirror a tremendous exhaust filled with brilliant white sparkles. "'You like it?' yelled the psychist. "'It's terrific!' Barlow yelled back. "'It's—' He was shut up as the car pulled out from the bay into the road with a great vroom. A gale roared past Barlow's head, though the window seemed to be closed. The impression of speed was terrific. He located the speedometer on the dashboard and saw it climb past ninety, one hundred, one fifty, and two hundred. Fast enough for me, yelled the psychist, noting that Barlow's face fell in response. Radio? He passed over a surprisingly light object like a football helmet with no trailing wires and pointed to a row of buttons. Barlow put on the helmet glad to have the roar of air stilled, and pushed a push-button. It lit up satisfyingly, and Barlow settled back even further for a sample of the brave new world's supermodern taste in ingenious entertainment. "'Take it and stick it!' a voice roared in his ears. He snatched off the helmet and gave the psychist an injured look. Tinny Pete grinned and turned a dial associated with the push-button layout. The man from the past donned the helmet again and found the voice had lowered to normal. The show of shows, uh, the super show, uh, the super duper show, the quiz of quizzes, take it and stick it! There were shrieks of laughter in the background. Here we got the contestants all ready to go. You know how we work it. I hand a contestant a triangle shaped cutout and like that down the line. Now we got these here boards. They got cut out places the same shape as the triangles and things, only they're all different shapes. And the first contestant that sticks the cutouts into the board, he wins. Now I'm going to interview the first contestant right here, honey. What's your name? Name? Uh, how do you like that, folks? She don't remember her name, huh? Would you buy that for a quarter? The question was spoken with arch significance, and the audience shrieked, howled, and whistled its appreciation. It was dull listening when you didn't know the punch lines and catch lines. Barlow pushed another button with his free hand, ready at the volume control. Latest from Washington. It's about Senator Hole Mendoza. He is still attacking the Bureau of Fisheries. The North Carolina syndicalist says he got affidavits that John Kinsley Schultz is a blue nose from way back. He didn't publish that, the affidavits, but he says they say that Kinsley Schultz was saw at blue nose meetings in Oregon State College and later at Florida University. Kingsley Schultz says he got to confess he did major in fly casting at Oregon and got his Ph.D. in game fish at Florida. And here is a quote from Kingsley Schultz. Old Mendoza don't know what he's talking about. He should drop dead. Unquote. 
Paul Mendoza says he won't publish that the affidavits to protect his sources. He says they were sworn by three former employees of the Bureau, which was fired for incompetence and incompatibility by Kingsley Schultz. Elsewhere, there was the usual run of traffic accidents. A three-way pileup of cars on Route 66 going out of Chicago took 12 lives. The Chicago-Los Angeles morning rocket crashed and exploded in the Mojave, Mojave, whatever you call it, desert. All the 94 people aboard got killed. A Civil Aeronautics Authority investigator on the scene says that the pilot was buzzing herds of sheep and didn't pull out in time. Hey, here's a hot one from New York. A diesel tug run wild in the harbor while the crew was below and shoved in the port bow of the luxury liner S.S. Placentia. It says the ship filled and sank, taking the lives of an estimated 180 passengers and 50 crew members. Six divers was sent down to study the wreckage, but they died too, when their suits turned out to be full of little hoes. And there is a bulletin I just got from Denver. It seems... Barlow took off the headset uncomprehendingly. He seems so callous, he yelled at the driver. I was listening to a newscast. Tinny Pete shook his head and pointed at his ears. The roar of air was deafening. Barlow frowned baffledly and stared out of the window. A glowing sign said, Moogs, would you buy it for a quarter? He didn't know what Moogs was or were. The illustration showed an incredibly proportioned girl, 99.9% .9 naked, writhing passionately in animated full color. The roadside jingle was still with him, but with a new feature. Radar or something spotted the car and alerted the lines of the jingle. Each, in turn, sped along a roadside track, even with the car, so it could be read before the next line was alerted. If there is a girl you want to defoculize, unromantic sweat, arm pito. Another animated job in two panels, the familiar before and after. The first said, just any cigar, and was illustrated with a two-person domestic tragedy of a wife holding her nose, while her coarse and red-faced husband puffed a slimy-looking rope. The second panel glowed, or a vuelta abajo, and was illustrated with... Barlow blushed and looked at his feet until they had passed the sign. Coming into Chicago, bawled Tinny Pete. Other cars were showing up, all of them dreamboats. Watching them, Barlow began to wonder if he knew what a kilometer was exactly. They seemed to be traveling so slowly, if you ignored the roaring air past your ears, and didn't let the speedy lines of the dreamboats fool you. He would have sworn that they were really crawling along at twenty-five, with occasional spurts up to thirty. How much was a kilometer, anyway? The city loomed ahead, and was just what it ought to be. Towering skyscrapers, overhead ramps, landing platforms for helicopters. He clutched at the cushions. Those two copters, they were going to, they were going to, they... He didn't see what happened, because their apparent collision courses took them behind a giant building. Screamingly sweet blasts of sound surrounded them as they stopped for a red light. What the hell is going on here? said Barlow, in a shrill, frightened voice, because the breaking time was just about zero. He wasn't hurled against the dashboard. Who's kidding who? Oh, why, what's the matter? demanded the driver. The light changed to green, and he started the pickup. Barlow stiffened as he realized that the rush of air past his ears began just a brief, unreal split second before the car was actually moving. He grabbed for the door handle on his side. The city grew on them slowly, scattered buildings, denser buildings, taller buildings, and a red light ahead. The car rolled to a stop in zero braking time. The rush of air cut off an instant after it stopped, and Barlow was out of the car, running frenziedly down a sidewalk one instant after that. <sighs> They'll track me down, 
he thought, panting. It's a secret police thing. They'll get you mind-reading machines, television eyes everywhere. Afraid you'll tell their slaves about freedom and stuff. They don't let anybody cross them, like that story I once read. Winded, he slowed to a walk and congratulated himself that he had guts enough not to turn around. That was what they always watched for. Walking, he was just another business-suited back among hundreds. He would be safe. He would be safe. A hand tumbled from a large, coarse, handsome face thrust close to his. What's the matter? Bumping in a people like you on a sidewalk? Got a minor slam you in a mushy of bazaar? It was neither the mad potter nor the mad driver. Excuse me, said Bartle. What did you say? Oh, yeah, yelled the stranger dangerously and waited for an answer. Barlow, with a feeling that he had somehow been suckered into the short end of an intricate land title deal, heard himself reply belligerently, Yeah! The stranger let go of his shoulder and snarled, Oh, yeah? Yeah, said Barlow, yanking his jacket back into shape. Ah, snarled the stranger with more contempt and disgust than ferocity. He added an obscenity current in Barlow's time, a standard but physiologically impossible directive, and strutted off hulking his shoulders and bawling his fists. Well, Barlow walked on trembling. Evidently he had handled it well enough. He stopped at a red light while the long, low dreamboats roared before him, and pedestrians in the sidewalk flew with him, threaded their ways through the stream of cars. Brakes screamed. Fenders clanged and dented, hoarse cries flew back and forth, between drivers and walkers. He leaped backward frantically as one car swerved over an arc of sidewalk to miss another. The signal changed to green. The cars kept on coming for about thirty seconds, and then dwindled to an occasional light runner. Bartle crossed warily and leaned against a vending machine, blowing big breaths. Look natural! He told himself, do something normal, buy something from the machine. He fumbled out some change, got a newspaper for a dime, a handkerchief for a quarter, and a candy bar for another quarter. The faint chocolate smell made him ravenous suddenly. He clawed at the glassy wrapper printed grigglies quite futilely for a few seconds, and then it divided neatly by itself. The bar made three good bites, and he bought two more and gobbled them down. Thirsty, he drew a carbonated orange drink in another one of the glassy wrappers from the machine for another dime. When he fumbled with it, it divided neatly and spilled all over his knees. Then Barlow decided that he had been there long enough and walked on. The shop windows were shop windows. People still wore and bought clothes, still smoked and bought tobacco, still ate and bought food, and they still went to the movies, he saw with pleased surprise. He passed and then returned to a glittering place whose sign said it was the Bijou. The place seemed to be showing a quintuple figure. Babies are terrible. Don't have children. And the Canale Kid. It was irresistible. He paid a dollar and went in. He caught the tail end of the Canali Kid in three-dimensional, full-color, full-scent production. It appeared to be an interplanetary saga winding up with a chase scene and a reconciliation between estranged hero and heroine. Babies are terrible and don't have children were fantastic arguments against parenthood the grotesquely exaggerated dangers of painfully graphic childbirth, vicious children, old parents beaten and starved by their sadistic offspring. The audience, Barlow astoundingly noted, was placidly champing sweets and showing no particular signs of revulsion. The coming attractions drove him into the lobby, the fanfares were shattering, the blazing colors blinding, and the added scents stomach heaving. End of The Marching Morons Part 1 by C. M. Cornbluth
The Marching Morons by C. M. Cornbluth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Jones, Benita Springs, Florida. The Marching Morons, Part 2, by C. M. Cornbluth. When his eyes again became accustomed to the moderate lighting of the lobby, he groped his way to a bench and opened the newspaper he had bought. It turned out to be the racing sheet, which afflicted him with a crushing sense of loss. The familiar boxed index in the lower left-hand corner of the front page showed almost unbearably that Churchill Downs and Empire City were still in business. Blinking back tears, he turned to the past performances at Churchill. They weren't using abbreviations any more, and the pages, because of that, were single column instead of double. But it was all the same. Or was it? He squinted at the first race, a three-quarter mile maiden claimer for thirteen hundred dollars. Incredibly, the track record was two minutes, ten and three-fifths second. Any beetle in his time could have knocked off the three quarters in one fifteen. It was the same for the other distances, much worse for root events. What the hell had happened to everything? He studied the form of a five-year-old brown mare in a second, and couldn't make head or tail of it. She had won and lost and placed and showed and lost and placed without a rhyme or reason. She looked like a front-runner for a couple of races, and then she looked like a no-good pig, and then she looked like a mudder. But the next time it rained, she wasn't, and then she was a stayer, and then again she was a pig again. In a good $5,000 allowances event, too. Barlow looked at the other entries, and it slowly dawned on him that they were all like the five-year-old brown mare. Not a single damned horse running had the slightest trace of class. Somebody sat down beside him and said, That's the story. Barlow whirled to his feet, and so it was Tinny Pete, his driver. I was in doubts about telling you, said the psychist, but I see you have some growing suspicions of the truth. Please don't get excited. It's all right, I tell you. So you got me, said Barlow. Got you? Don't pretend. I can put two and two together. You're the secret police. You and the rest of the aristocrats live in luxury on the sweat of these oppressed slaves. You're afraid of me because you have to keep them ignorant. <laughs> there was a bellow of bright laughter from the psychist that got them blank looks from other patrons of the lobby. The laughter didn't sound at all sinister. Let's get out of here, said Tinny Pete, still chuckling. You couldn't possibly have it more wrong. He engaged Barlow's arm and led him to the street. The actual truth is that the millions of workers live in luxury on the sweat of the handful of aristocrats. I shall probably die before my time of overwork, unless, he gave Barlow a speculative look, you may be able to help us. I know that gag, sneered Barlow. I made money in my time, and to make money you have to get people on your side. Go ahead and shoot me if you want, but you're not going to make a fool out of me. You nasty little ingrate, snapped the psychist with a kaleidoscopic change of mood. This damned mess is all your fault and the fault of people like you. Now come along and no more of your nonsense. He yanked Barlow into an office building lobby and an elevator that disconcertingly went whoosh loudly as it rose. The real estate man's knees were wobbly as the psychist pushed him from the elevator down a corridor and into an office. A hawk-faced man rose from a plain chair as the door closed behind them. After an angry look at Barlow, he asked the psychist, Was I called from the pole to inspect this, this? Unget up, dandard. I've deprobed it fine quasi-chance XM aprob bat attack line, said the psychist soothingly. Doubt, cried the hawk-faced man. Try, suggested Tinny Pete. 
Very well, Mr. Barlow. I understand you and your lamented had no children. Uh, what of it? This of it? You were a blind, selfish, stupid ass to tolerate economic and social conditions which penalized childbearing by the prudent and the foresighted. You made us what we are today, and I want you to know that we are far from satisfied. Damn fool rockets, damn fool automobiles, damn fool cities with overhead ramps. As far as I can see, said Barlow, you're running down the best features of time. Are you crazy? The rockets aren't rockets. They're turbojets. Good turbojets, but the fancy shell around them makes for a bad drag. The automobiles have a top speed of 100 kilometers per hour. A kilometer is, if I recall my paleolinguistics, three-fifths of a mile. And the speedometers are all rigged accordingly, so the drivers will think they're going 250. The cities are ridiculous, expansive, unsanitary, wasteful conglomerations of people would be better off and more productive if they were spread over the countryside. We need the rockets and tricks, speedometers and cities because, while you and your kind were being prudent and foresighted and not having children, the migrant workers, slum dwellers, and tenant farmers were shiftlessly and short-sightedly having children. Breeding! Breeding! My God, how they bred! Wait a minute, objected Barlow. There were lots of people in our crowd who had two or three children. The attrition of accidents, illness, wars, and such took care of that. Your intelligence was bred out. It is gone. Children that should have been born never were. The just average, they'll get along, majority, took over the population. The average IQ now is 45. But that's far in the future. So are you, grunted the hawk-faced man sourly. But who are you people? Just people, real people. Some generations ago, the geneticists realized at last that nobody was going to pay any attention to what they said. So they abandoned words for deeds. Specifically, they formed and recruited for a closed corporation intended to maintain and improve the breed. We are their descendants, about three million of us. There are five billion of the others, so we are their slaves. During the past couple of years, I've designed a skyscraper, kept Billings Memorial Hospital here in Chicago running, headed off war with Mexico, and directed traffic at LaGuardia Field in New York. I don't understand. Why don't you let them go to hell in their own way? The man grimaced. We tried it once for three months. We holed up at the South Pole and waited. They didn't notice it. Some drafting room people were missing. Some chief nurses didn't show up. Minor government people on the non-policy level couldn't be located. It didn't seem to matter. In a week there was hunger. In two weeks there were famine and plague. In three weeks war and anarchy. We called off the experiment. It took us most of the next generation to get things squared away again. But why didn't you let them kill each other off? Five billion corpses mean about five hundred million tons of rotting flesh. Hmm. Barlow had another idea. Why don't you sterilize them? Two and one-half billion operations is a lot of operations. Because they breed continuously, the job would never be done. Oh, I see. Like the marching Chinese. Who the devil are they? It was a, um, a paradox of my time. Somebody figured out that if all the Chinese in the world were to line up four abreast, I think it was, and start marching past a given point, they'd never stop because of the babies that would be born and grow up before they passed the point. Oh, that's right. Only instead of a given point, make it the largest conceivable number of operating rooms that we could build and staff. There could never be enough. Say, said Barlow, 
Those movies about babies, was that your propaganda? It was. It doesn't seem to mean a thing to them. We have abandoned the idea of attempting propaganda contrary to a biological drive. So if you work with a biological drive, I know of none which is consistent with inhibition of fertility. Barlow's face went poker blank, the result of years of careful discipline. You don't, huh? You're the great brains, and you can't think of any? Why, no, said the psychist innocently. Can you? Uh, that depends. I sold ten thousand acres of Siberian tundra, through a dummy firm, of course, after the partition of Russia. The buyers thought they were getting improved building lots on the outskirts of Kiev. I'd say that was a lot tougher than this job. How so? asked the hawk-faced man. Those were normal, suspicious customers, and these are morons, born suckers. You just figure out a con they'll fall for. They won't know enough to do any smart checking. The psychist and the hawk-faced man had also had training. They kept themselves from looking with sudden hope at each other. You seem to have something in mind, said the psychist. Barlow's poker face went blanker still. Maybe I have. I haven't heard any offer yet. There's the satisfaction of knowing that you've prevented Earth's resources from being so plundered, the hawk-faced man pointed out, that the race will soon become extinct. I don't know that, Barlow said bluntly. All I have is your word. If you really have a method... I don't think any price would be too great, the psychist offered. Money? said Barlow. All you want. More than you want, the hawk-faced man corrected. Prestige? added Barlow. Plenty of publicity. My picture and my name in the papers and over TV every day. Statues to me. Parks and cities and streets and other things named after me. A whole chapter in the history books. The psychist made a facial sign to the hawk-faced man that meant, Oh, brother! The hawk-faced man signaled back, Steady, boy! It's not too much to ask, the psychist agreed. Barlow, sensing a seller's market, said, Power! Power? The hawk-faced man repeated puzzledly, Your own hydro station or nuclear pile? I mean a world dictatorship with me as dictator. Well, now, said the psychist, but the hawk-faced man interrupted. It would take a special emergency act of Congress, but the situation warrants it. I think that can be guaranteed. Could you give us some indication of your plan? the psychist asked. Ever hear of lemmings? No. They are, were, I guess, since you haven't heard of them, little animals in Norway, and every few years they swarm to the coast and swim out to sea until they drowned. I figure on putting some lemming urge into the population. Well, how? I'll save that till I get the right signatures on the deal. The hawk-faced man said, I'd like to work with you on it, Barlow. My name's Ryan Ngana, he put out his hand. Barlow looked closely at the hand, then at the man's face. Ryan what? Ngana. That sounds like an African name. It is. My mother's father was a Watusi. Barlow didn't take the hand. I thought you looked pretty dark. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I don't think I'd be at my best working with you. There must be somebody else just as well qualified, I'm sure. The psychist made a facial sign to Ryan Ngana that meant, Steady yourself, boy. Very well, Ryan Ngana told Barlow. We'll see what arrangement can be made. It's not that I'm prejudiced, you understand. Some of my best friends... Mr. Barlow, don't give it another thought. Anybody who can pick on the lemming analogy is going to be useful to us. And so he would, thought Ryan Ngana, alone in the office after Tinny Pete had taken Barlow up to the helicopter stage. So he would. 
Pop Prob had exhausted every rational attempt, and the new Pop Prob attack lines would have to be irrational or subrational. This creature from the past, with his limbing legends and his improved building lots, would be a fountain of precious, vicious self interest. Ryan Ingana sighed and stretched. He had to go and run the San Francisco subway. Summoned early from the pool to study Barlow, he had left unfinished a nice little theorem. Between interruptions, he was slowly constructing an indimensional geometry whose foundations and superstructure owed no debt whatsoever to intuition. Upstairs, waiting for a helicopter, Barlow was explaining to Tinny Pete that he had nothing against Negroes, and Tinny Pete wished he had some Ryan and Ghana's imperturbability and humor for the ordeal. The helicopter took them to International Airport, where, Tinny Pete explained, Barlow would leave for the pole. The man from the past wasn't sure he'd like a dreary waste of ice and cold. Oh, it's all right, said the psychist. A civilized layout, warm and pleasant. You'll be able to work more efficiently there. All the facts at your fingertips, a good secretary. I'll need a pretty big staff, said Barlow, who had learned from thousands of deals never to take the first offer. I meant a private confidential one, said Tinny Pete readily. But you can have as many as you want. You'll naturally have a top primary top priority if you really have a workable plan. Well, let's not forget this dictatorship angle, said Barlow. He didn't know that the psychist would just as readily have promised him deification to get him happily on the rocket for the pole. Tinny Pete had no wish to be torn limb from limb. He knew very well that it would end that way if the population learned from this anachronism that there was a small elite which considered itself head, shoulders, trunk, and groin above the rest. The fact that this assumption was perfectly true, and the fact that the elite was condemned by its superiority to a life of the most grinding toil, would not be considered. The difference would. The psychist finally put Barlow aboard the rocket with some thirty people, real people, headed for the pole. Barlow was airsick all the way because of a post-hypnotic suggestion Tinny Pete had planted in him. One idea was to make him as averse as possible to a return trip, and another idea was to spare the other passengers from his aggressive, talkative company. Barlow, during the first day at the pole, was reminded of his first day in the army. It was the same, now where the hell are we going to put you, business, until he took a firm line with them. Then instead of acting like supply sergeants, they acted like hotel clerks. It was a wonderful, wonderfully calculated build-up, and one that he failed to suspect. After all, in his time, a visitor from the past would have been lionized. At day's end, he reclined in a snug underground billet with the sixty-mile gales roaring yards overhead, and tried to put two and two together. It was like the old times, he thought, like a coup in real estate where you had the competition by the throat, like a fifty percent rent boost when you knew damned well there was no place for the tenants to move, like smiling when you read over the breakfast orange juice that the city council had decided to build a school on the ground you had acquired by a deal with the city council. And it was simple. He would just sell tundra building lots to eagerly suicidal lemmings, and that was absolutely all there was to solving the problem that had these double domes spinning. They'd have to work out most of the details, naturally, but what the hell? That was what subordinates were for. He'd need specialists in advertising, engineering, communications. Did they know anything about hypnotism? That might be helpful. If not, there'd have to be a lot of bribery done, but he'd make sure, damn sure, there were unlimited funds. Just selling building lots to lemmings. He wished as he fell asleep that poor Verna could have been in on this. It was his biggest, most stupendous deal. Verna, that sharp shyster Sam Emmerman, must have swindled her. 
It began the next day with people coming to visit him. He knew the approach. They merely wanted to be helpful to their illustrious visitor from the past, and would he help fill them in in about his era, which unfortunately was somewhat obscure historically, and what did he think could be done about the problem? He told them he was too old to be roped any more, and they wouldn't get any information out of him until he got a letter of intent from at least the polar president and a session of the Polar Congress empowered to make him dictator. He got the letter and the session. He presented his program, was asked whether his conscience didn't revolt at its callousness, explained succinctly that a deal was a deal, and anybody who wasn't smart enough to protect himself didn't deserve protection. Caveat emptor, he threw in for scholarship, and had to translate it to let the buyer beware. He didn't, he stated, give a damn about either the morons or their intelligent slaves. He had told them his price, and that was all he was interested in. Would they meet it, or wouldn't they? The polar president offered to resign in his favor with certain temporary emergency powers that the polar congress would vote him, if he thought them necessary. Barlow demanded the title of world dictator, complete control of world finances, salary to be decided by himself, and the publicity campaign and historical write-up to begin at once. As for the emergency powers, he added, they are neither to be temporary nor limited. Somebody wanted the floor to discuss the matter, with the declared hope that perhaps Barlow would modify his demands. "'You've got the proposition,' Barlow said. "'I'm not knocking off even ten percent.' "'But what if the Congress refuses, sir?' the President asked. "'Then they can stay up here at the pole and try to work it out yourselves. "'I'll get what I want from the morons. "'A shrewd operator like me doesn't have to compromise. "'I haven't got a single competitor in this whole cock-eyed moronic era.' Congress waived debate and voted by show of hands. Barlow won unanimously. "'You don't know how close you came to losing me,' he said in his first official address to the joint houses. "'I'm not the boy to haggle. Either I get what I ask, or I go elsewhere. The first thing I want is to see designs for a new palace for me. Nothing unostentatious, either.' and your best painters and sculptors to start working on my portraits and statues. Meanwhile, I'll get my staff together. He dismissed the Polar President and the Polar Congress, telling them that he had let them know when the next meeting would be. A week later, the program started with North America the first target. Mrs. Garvey was arresting after dinner, before the ordeal of turning on the dishwasher. The TV, of course, was on, and it said, Ooh! Long, shuddery, and ecstatic, the cue for the Parfum Assault Criminale, spot commercial. Girls, said the announcer hoarsely, do you want your man? It's easy to get him, easy as a trip to Venus. Huh? said Mrs. Garvey. What's the matter? snorted her husband, starting out of a doze. You hear that? What? He said, easy like a trip to Venus. So? Well, I thought you couldn't get to Venus. I thought they just had that one rocket thing that crashed on the moon. Ah, women don't keep up with the news, said Garvey righteously, subsiding again. Oh, said his wife uncertainly. And the next day, on Henry's other mistress, there was a new character who had just breezed in, Buzz Rentjaw, master rocket pilot on the Venus run. On Henry's other mistress, the broadcast drama about you and your neighbors, folksy people, ordinary people, real people. Mrs. Garvey listened with an amazement over a cooling cup of coffee as Buzz made hay for her hazy convictions. Mona, oh, darling, it's so good to see you again. Buzz, you don't know how I've missed you on that dreary Venus run. Sound. Venetian blinds run down. Key turned in door lock. Mona. Was it very dull, dearest? 
Buzz, let's not talk about my humdrum job, darling. Let's talk about us. Sound creaking bed. Well, the program was back to normal at last. That evening, Mrs. Garvey tried to ask again whether her husband was sure about those rockets, but he was dozing right through, take it and stick it, so she watched the screen and forgot the puzzle. She was still rocking with laughter at the gag line, would you buy it for a quarter? When the commercial went on for the detergent powder she always faithfully loaded her dishwasher with on the first of every month. The announcer displayed mountains of subs from a tiny piece of the stuff and coyly added, Of course, Clean-O don't lay around for you to pick up like the soap root on Venus, but it's pretty cheap and it's almost pretty near just as good. So for us plain folks who ain't lucky enough to live up there on Venus, Clean-O is the real cleaning stuff. Then the chorus went into their Clean-O is the stuff jingle but Mrs. Garvey didn't hear it. She was a stubborn woman, but it occurred to her that she was very sick indeed. She didn't want to worry her husband. The next day she quietly made an appointment with her family Freud. In the waiting room she picked up a fresh new copy of Reader's Pablum and put it down with a faint palpitation. The lead article, according to the table of contents on the cover, was titled the most memorable Venusian I ever met. The Freud will see you now, said the nurse, and Mrs. Garvey tottered into his office. His traditional glasses and whiskers were reassuring. She choked out the ritual, Freud, forgive me, for I have neuroses. He chanted the antiphonal, Tut, my dear girl, what seems to be the trouble? I got like a hole in the head, she quavered, I seem to forget all kinds of things, things like everybody seems to know, and I don't. Well, that happens to everybody occasionally, my dear. I suggest a vacation on Venus. The Freud stared open mouthed at the empty chair. His nurse came in and demanded, Hey, did you see how she scrammed? What was the matter with her? He took off his glasses and whiskers meditatively. You can search me. I told her she would maybe try a vacation on Venus. A momentary bafflement came into his face, and he dug through his desk drawers until he found a copy of the four-color, profusely illustrated journal of his profession. It had come that morning, and he had lip-read it, though, though looking mostly at the pictures. He leafed through to the article, Advantages of the Planet Venus in Rest Cures. It's right there, he said. The nurse looked. It sure is, she agreed. Why shouldn't it be? The trouble with these here neurotics, decided the Freud, is that they all the time got to fight reality. Show in the next twitch. He put on his glasses and whiskers again, and forgot Mrs. Garvey and her strange behavior. Freud, forgive me, for I have neuroses. Tut, my dear girl. What seems to be the trouble? Like many cures of mental disorders, Mrs. Garvey's was achieved largely by self-treatment. She disciplined herself sternly out of the crazy notion that there had been only one rocket ship, and that one a failure. She could join without wincing eventually in any conversation on the desirability of Venus as a place to retire on this fabulous floral profusion. Finally, she went to Venus. All her friends were trying to book passage with the Evening Star Travel and Real Estate Corporation, but naturally the demand was crushing. She considered herself lucky to get a seat at last for the two-week summer cruise. The spaceship took off from a place called Los Alamos, New Mexico. It looked just like all the spaceships on television and in the picture magazines, but was more comfortable than you would expect. Mrs. Garvey was delighted with the fifty or so fellow passengers assembled before takeoff. They were from all over the country, and she had a distinct impression that they were on the brainy side. The captain, a tall, hawk-faced, impressive fellow named Ryan something or other, welcomed them aboard and trusted that their trip would be a memorable one. He regretted that there would be nothing to see because 
due to the meteorite season the ports would be dogged down it was disappointing yet reassuring that the line was taking no chances there was the expected momentary discomfort at take-off and then two monotonous days of droning travel through space to be whiled away in the lounge at cards and craps the landing was a routine bump voyagers were issued tablets to swallow to immunize them against any minor ailments when the tablets took effect the lock was opened and venus was theirs it looked much like a tropical island on earth except for a blanket of cloud overhead but it had a heady other-world quality that was intoxicating and glamorous the ten days of the vacation were suffused with a hazy magic the soap root is advertised was free and sudsy the fruits mostly tropical varieties transplanted from earth were delightful the simple shelters provided by the travel company were more than adequate for the balmy days and nights it was with sincere regret that the voyagers filed again into their ship and swallowed more tablets doled out to counteract and sterilize any venous illnesses they might unwittingly communicate to earth vacationing was one thing power politics was another at the pole a small man was in a soundproof room his face deathly pale and his body limp in a straight chair in the american senate chamber senator hull mendoza syndicate north california was saying mr president and gentlemen i would be remiss in my duty as a legislator if i didn't bring to the attention of the august body i see here a perilous situation which is fraught with peril as is well known to the members of this august body the perfection of space flight has brought with it a situation i can only describe as fraught with peril mr president and gentlemen now that swift american rockets now traverse the trackless void of space between this planet and our nearest planetary neighbor in space and gentlemen i refer to venus the star of dawn the brightest jewel in fair vulcan's diadem now i say i want to inquire what steps are being taken to colonize venus with a vanguard of patriotic citizens like those minute men of yore mr president and gentlemen there are in this world nations envious nations i do not name mexico who by fair means or foul may seek to wrest from columbia's grasp the torch of freedom of space nations whose low living standards and innate depravity give them an unfair advantage over the citizens of our fair republic this is my program i suggest that a city of more than one hundred thousand population be selected by lot the citizens of the fortunate city are to be awarded choice lands on venus free and clear to have and to hold and convey to their descendants and the national government shall provide free transportation to venus for these citizens and this program shall continue city by city until there has been deposited on venus a sufficient vanguard of citizens to protect our manifest rights in that planet objections will be raised for carping critics we have always with us they will say that there isn't enough steel they will call it a cheap giveaway i say there is enough steel for one city's population to be transferred to venus and that is all that is needed for when the time comes for the second city to be transferred the first emptied city shall be wrecked for the needed steel and is it a giveaway yes it is the most glorious giveaway in the history of mankind mr president and gentlemen there is no time to waste venus must be american black cooperman at the pole opened his eyes and said feebly the style was a little uneven do you think anybody'll notice you did fine boy just fine barlow reassured him hull mendoza's bill became law drafting machines at the south pole were busy around the clock and the pittsburgh steel mills spewed millions of plates into the los alamos spaceport of the evening star travel and real estate corporation 
It was going to be Los Angeles, for logistic reasons, and the three most accomplished psychokineticists went to Washington and mingled with the crowd at the drawing to make certain that the Los Angeles capsule slithered into the fingers of the blindfolded senator. Los Angeles loved the idea, and a forest of spaceships began to blossom in the desert. They weren't very good spaceships, but they didn't have to be. A team at the South Pole worked at Barlow's direction on a mail setup. There would have to be letters to and from Venus to keep the slightest taint of suspicion from arising. Luckily, Barlow remembered that the problem had been solved once before by Hitler. Relatives of persons incinerated in the furnaces of Lublin or Majdanek continued to get cheery postal cards. The Los Angeles flight went off on schedule under tremendous press, newsreel, and television coverage. The world cheered the gallant Angelinos who were setting off on their patriotic voyage to the land of milk and honey. The forest of spaceships thundered up and up and out of sight without untoward incidents. Billions envied the Angelinos, cramped and short on rations though they were. Wreckers from San Francisco whose capsule came up second, moved immediately into the city of the angels for the scrap steel their own flight would require. Senator Hull Mendoza's constituents could do no less. The president of Mexico, hypnotically alarmed at this extension of Yankee imperialismo beyond the stratosphere, launched his own Venus colony program. Across the water it was England versus Ireland, France versus Germany, China versus Russia, India versus Indonesia. Ancient hatreds grew into the flames that were rocket ships assailing the air by hundreds daily. Dear Ed, how are you? Sam and I are fine and hope you are fine. Is it nice up there, like they say, with food and close grown on trees? I drove by Springfield yesterday and it sure looked funny all the buildings down, but of course it is worth it. We have to keep the greasers in their place. Do you have any trouble with them on Venus? Drop me a line sometime. Your loving sister, Alma. Dear Alma, I am fine, and I hope you are fine. It is a fine place here, fine climate and easy living. The doctor told me today that I seem to be ten years younger. He thinks there is something in the air here keeps people young. We do not have much trouble with the greasers here. They keep to their sails. It is just a question of us outnumbering them and staking out the best places for Americans. In South Bay, I know a nice little island that I have been saving for. You and Sam with lots of blanket trees and ham bushes. Hoping to see you and Sam soon. Your loving brother, Ed. Sam and Alma were on their way shortly. Pop Prob got a dividend in every nation after the immigration had passed the halfway mark. The lonesome stay-at-homes were unable to bear the melancholy of a low population density. Their conditioning had been to swarms of their kin. After that point it was possible to foist off on the crudest, stripped-down accommodations on would-be immigrants. They didn't care. Black Cooperman did a final job on President Hull Mendoza, the last job that genius of hypnotics would ever do on any moron, important or otherwise. Hull Mendoza, panic-stricken by his presidency over an empty nation, joined his constituents. The independence, aboard which traveled the National Government of America, was the most elaborate of all the spaceships, bigger, more comfortable, with a lounge that was handsome, though cramped, and cloakrooms for senators and representatives. It went, however, to the same place as the others, and Black Cooperman killed himself, leaving a note that stated he couldn't live with my conscience. The day after the American president departed, Barlow flew into a rage. Across his specially built desk were supposed to flow all pop-prob high-level documents, and this thing, this outrageous thing called pop rob term apparently had gotten into the executive stage before he had even had a glimpse of it. 
he buzzed for Roger Smith, his statistician. Roger Smith seemed to be at the bottom of it. Pop prob terms seemed to be about first and second and third derivatives, whatever they were. Barlow had a deep distrust of anything more complex than what he called an average. While Roger Smith was still at the door, Barlow snapped, What's the meaning of this? Why haven't I been consulted? How far have you people got, and why have you been working on something I haven't authorized? Didn't want to bother you, Chief, said Rosie Smith. It was really a technical matter, a kind of final clean-up. Want to come and see the work? Mollified, Barlow followed his statistician down the corridor. You still shouldn't have gone ahead without my okay, he grumbled. Where the hell would you people have been without me? That's right, Chief. We wouldn't have swung it ourselves. Our minds just don't work that way. And all that stuff you knew from Hitler, it wouldn't have occurred to us like poor Black Cooperman. They were in a fair-sized machine shop at the end of a slight upward incline. It was cold. Roger Smith pushed a button, started a motor, and a flood of arctic light poured in as the roof parted slowly. It showed a small spaceship with a door open. Barlow gaped as Rosy Smith took him by the elbow, and his other boys appeared, Swinson Swinson the engineer, Tsutsu Gimushi Duncan, his propellants man, called French advertising. "'In you go, chief,' said Tsutsu Gimushi Duncan. "'This is Paprob term.' "'But I'm the world dictator.' "'You bet, chief. You'll be in history, all right. But this is necessary, I'm afraid.' The door closed. Acceleration slammed Barlow cruelly to the metal floor. Something broke, and warm, wet stuff, salty-tasting, ran from his mouth to his chin. Arctic sunlight through a port suddenly became a fierce lancet stabbing his eyes. He was out of the atmosphere. Lying twisted and broken under the acceleration, Barlow realized that some things had not changed, that Jack Ketch was never asked to dinner, however many shillings you paid him to do your dirty work, that murder will out, that crime pays only temporarily. The last thing he learned was that death is the end of pain. End of the Marching Morons Part 2 by C. M. Cornbluth The Professor by Callista Halsey Patchen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Professor by Callista Halsey Patchen The Professor had been dead two months. He had left the world very quietly at that precise hour of the early evening when he was accustomed to say that his spirit friends came to him. The hospital nurse noticed that there was always a time at twilight when the patient had a good hour, when pain and restlessness seemed to be charmed away, and he did not mind being left alone, and did not care whether or not there was a light in the room. Then it was that those who had gone came back to him with quiet, friendly ways and loving touch. He said nothing of this to the nurse. It was an old friend who told me that this had been his belief and solace for years. When the professor had first come to town, he had spoken of the wife who would follow him shortly from the east. He did not display her picture, he did not talk about her enough so that the town, though it made an honest effort, ever really visualized her. She would come, without a doubt she would come, but not just yet. It was only that the east still held her. Gradually he spoke of her less and less often, with a dignified reserve that brooked no inquiry, and finally, not at all. The town forgot. It was only when his illness became so serious that all felt someone should be written to that it was discovered there was no one. The professor, when he was appealed to, said so. 
Then also the hospital nurse noticed that at the twilight hour, when he talked quietly to his unseen friends, there was always one who stayed longer than the rest. But he had been dead two months now, and the undertaker was pressing his bill, and there were other expenses which had been cheerfully borne by friends at the time, and indeed if there had been no other reason, it remains that something must become of the personal possessions of a man who leaves neither will nor known heirs. So the professor's effects were praised, and a brief local appeared in the daily paper until it had made a dent in the memory of the public, apprising them that his personal property would be offered at public auction at 2 p.m. of a Thursday in his rooms on the third floor of the Eureka block. It was the merest thread of curiosity that drew me to this sale. I did not want to buy anything. It was a sort of posthumous curiosity, and it concerned itself solely with the individuality of the dead man. Not having had the opportunity of knowing him well in life, and never having known until I read his obituary what I had missed, I took this last chance of trying to evolve the man from his belongings. All I did know was that he was a teacher of music of the past generation in a western town which grew so fast that it made a man seem older than he was. More than this, he was a composer, a music master who took crude young voices, shrill with the tension of the western winds and the electric air, and tamed and trained them till they fell in love with harmony. When he heard a voice, he knew it. One of his contraltos is singing now in grand opera across the sea. A tenor that he discovered has charmed the world with an upper note. All the same, the professor had grown old. A new generation had arisen which knew not Joseph. He failed to advertise, and every young girl who gave lessons crowded him closer to the wall. Now and then there would appear in the daily paper, not the next morning, but a few days after the presentation of some opera, a column of musical criticism, keen, delicate, reminiscent, fragrant with the rosemary that is for remembrance. When Elijah was given by home talent with soloists imported from Chicago, it was the professor who kindly wrote beforehand this time luminous articles full of sympathetic interpretation of the great masters. And at rare intervals there would appear a communication from him on the beauty of the woods and the fields, the suburbs of the town and the country, as though he were some simple prophet of nature who stood by the wayside. And this was no affectation. Long, solitary walks were his recreation. It was a good deal of a rookery up the flights of narrow, dirty stairs to the third floor of the Eureka block. And here the professor had lived and taught. Two rooms were made from one by the sort of partition which does not reach to the ceiling, a ceiling which for some inexplicable reason was higher in some places than in others. The voice of the auctioneer came down that winding way in professional cadences. There were in the room about as many people as might come to a funeral where only friends of the family are invited. It was very still. The auctioneer took an easy conversational tone. There was a silent forlorn sort of dignity about the five pianos standing in a row that put professional banter and cheap little jokes out of the question. The pianos went without much trouble, a big one of the best make, an old-fashioned cottage piano, a piano with an iron frame. One of the appraisers, himself a musician, became an assistant auctioneer and kindly played a little, judiciously very little, on each instrument in turn. Then came the bric-a-brac of personal effects, all the flotsam and jetsam that had floated into these rooms for years. The walls were pockmarked with pictures, big and little. There was no attempt at high art. The professor had bought a picture as a child might buy one because he thought it was pretty. It was a curious showing of how one artistic faculty may be dormant while another is cultivated to its highest point. But no matter how cheap the picture, it was always conscientiously framed, and this was a great help to the auctioneer. Indeed, it was difficult to see how he could have cried the pictures at all without the frames. By this time, the rooms were fuller of people. There were ladies who had come in quietly just to get some little thing for remembrance of their old friend and teacher. 
These mostly went directly over to the corner where the music lay and began looking for something of his. If it were manuscript music, so much the better, but there was little of this. It appeared that, with the professor, as with most of us, early and middle manhood had been his most productive time, and that was long ago for everything to have been duly published in sheet and book form, long enough indeed for the books themselves to have gone out of date. There they were, long, green notebooks bearing the familiar names of well-known publishers, and with such a hydrahead of title as The Celestina, or New Sacred Minstrel, a repository of music adapted to every variety of taste and grade of capacity, from the million to the amateur or professor. There were four or five of these. There was sheet music by the pile. There was an opera, Joseph, the production of which had been a musical event. Presently the auctioneer came that way. He had just sold a large oleograph, framed, one of those gorgeous historical pictures which are an apotheosis of good clothes. He approached an engraving of an old-fashioned lady in voluminous muslin draperies, with her hair looped away from her face in a book of beauty style. He liked that, murmured a lady. What do I hear, cries the auctioneer softly. Oh, such a little bit as that. I can't see it at all in this dark corner. Suppose we throw these peaches in, awfully pretty things for dining room, and this flower piece. Shall we group these three? Now, how much for all? Ah, there they go. Here, ladies and gentlemen, is a gold-headed cane, which was presented to the deceased by his admiring friends. It is pure gold. You know they would not give him anything else. How much for this? How much? No, his name is not engraved on it. So much the better. What do I hear? Look at this telescope, gentlemen. A good one. You know the professor was quite an astronomer in his way. And this telescope is all right, sound, and in good condition. The auctioneer had officiated at a stock sale the day before. You can look right into futurity through this tube. Five dollars worth of futurity? Five? Five and a half? Case and all complete. There was a pocket full of odds and ends, gold pens, lead pencils, some odd pocket knives. These inconsiderable trifles brought more in proportion than articles of greater intrinsic value. Evidently this was an auction of memories, of emotion, of sentiment. There was a bit of the beam of the barn that was burned down when the cow kicked over the historic lamp that inaugurated the Chicago fire. No less than three persons were ready to testify to their belief in the genuineness of the relic, had anyone been disposed to question it, but no one was. Nearly all the people in the place were the dead music teacher's personal friends. They had heard the story of all these things. They knew who had sent him the stuffed brown prairie chicken that perched like a raven above the door, the little old-fashioned decanter and wine glasses of gilded glass, the artificial begonias, that clever imitation that goes far toward making one forswear begonias forevermore. There were lamps of various shapes and sizes. There was a kit of burglarious-looking tools for piano tuning. There was a little globe. Who wants the earth? said the auctioneer. You all want it. There was a metronome which, set to go, began to count time in a metallic whisper for some invisible pupil. Over in the corner just beyond the music were the professor's books. Now we shall find him out, for what a man reads he is, or wishes to be. There was a good deal of spiritualistic literature of the better sort. There was a history of Christianity and paganism by the Roman Emperor Julian, a copy of She, a long shelf full of North American reviews, a dozen or so of almanacs, a copy of Bluebeard. There were none of the popular magazines, and if there had been newspapers, those vagrants of literature, they had gone their way. There was a manuscript play for parlor presentation with each part written out in legible script entitled The Winning Card. All these and many more things which only the patient appraisers can fully know were sold or set aside as unsaleable until all was done, and then those who had known and loved him, and those who had not known or cared for him, came down the stairs together. Fate stood on the landing. As always, fate ran true to form. She was a woman, a little tired, as a woman might well be, who had come a thousand miles, a little out of breath, from the two flights of stairs. 
Her old-fashioned draperies clung about her. Her hair was looped away from her face in a Book of Beauty style. The man who stood aside to let her pass was talking. Of course, he was saying, he was a sidetracked man, but I believe he stands the biggest chance of being remembered of any man in Iowa. Swift protest at his first words clouded her face. Sheer gratitude for his last words illumined it. She bent forward a little and went on up the stairs alone. She faltered in the doorway, her hand fumbling at her throat. One of the men who had been talking below hastened to her side. It's all over, he said, then added, at the dumb misery that grayed her face, the auction. I, I didn't come for that, the apathy in her voice holding it steady. I, I am his wife. His last letter he sent for me. A sob broke her speech. It came last week, two months too late. End of the Professor by Callista Halsey Patchen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Snitch by Mert E. Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Snitch by Mert E. Smith Through that mean news channel that links every big penitentiary with the rendezvous of crooks in the outside world, a message had come to a man who had long since lost his identity in the number 7774. The message was brief, but it spoke volumes to the convict. It had come from a pal a former companion in the old days who had shared in many a job that required finely sandpapered fingertips to ensure mastery over the tumblers of the safe convict seven 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 four had come to number the days when good behavior would end a five-year sentence in less than four he had planned and resolved as many men before him down the eons of time to allow no act or influence to deviate him from a life of honesty. But the message changed him. It set another purpose, made the days seem ages longer than before, although the man could count the nearness of liberation on one hand. The day of his release came, a day with a dull, drab sky overhead, a day that enveloped his being, in the purpose at hand. Creeping stealthily along the passageway that admitted no light save that which came through the barred window in the door at its end, Kwok Wong, a fence for crooks and a keeper of an opium den, listened until a signal for entrance had been repeated with unmistakable distinction. Only until then did the Oriental approach near the door and open it slightly to scrutinize the features of his nocturnal visitor. "'It's me, Quok,' the voice whispered. "'Jimmy Dolan, don't you know me?' The Oriental continued to stare. He knew the face only too well, but if he recognized the man, he gave no indication. "'Come on, Quok, let me in. You know me. I come your place all the time. Long time ago. You remember. Got arrested here, sent to San Quentin, remember? After a moment, the Oriental asked, You in trouble? No, no trouble, Quok. Why do you ask? The Oriental did not answer. He drew back and allowed the white man to enter. The visitor strode down the passageway with a quick, nervous step. At the other end, he admitted himself to a dimly lighted room, where a row of monks on either side gave it the unmistakable identity of an opium den. The Oriental followed quickly behind him. "'Where's the gang, Quok? asked the man. "'All gone,' was the reply. Then, after a pause, "'Police man come. Raid. Slim. Him get catched. And Kid, too.' The name Kid smote upon the white man, and if the Oriental had noticed, he would have seen his eyes narrow. What'd they get the kid for? 
Police a man say break safe. He lies. Someone snitched. And the white man's attitude for a moment was menacing. Quickly, he recovered himself. Who stooled, he persisted, and his eyes bored through the Oriental until the slanted-eyed heathen had to shift his gaze. No understand. The Oriental has fortified himself behind two English words, which furnished an impenetrable barrier for further questioning, when the wily yellow race chooses to evade cross-examination. The white man shifted on his feet. Come on, Quok, give the layout. I haven't had a smoke in ages. Finished a five-year sentence this morning, cut to three and a half. The Oriental went to a closet and returned with a large tray and a thick pipe. The white man took off his coat and prepared to smoke. The Oriental watched the man's every move, all but one. Had his eyes remained on the white man, he would have seen a quick substitution of the opium to a harmless, hard substance, with the same pungent smell as the deadly drug that went into the pipe instead. The white man stretched himself on a lower bunk and, drawing deeply on the pipe, dropped off into the apparent lethargy that the juice of the poppy brings to its slaves. Satisfying himself that his visitor had gone to the land of dreams, the Oriental stole quietly from the rooms. If he had turned, he would have caught the white man's eyes following his movements. Half an hour elapsed. The white man never moved. Then the Oriental came back into the room. A figure followed him closely, but neither spoke. Him same dead, the Oriental said, after a silence, before which the newcomer had gone to the side of the sleeping man and raised an eyelid. Him no smoke four years, sleep much now, the Chinaman continued. All right, Quok, the man spoke for the first time. Keep an eye on that bird and let me know every time he comes here. We don't want him now, but you can never tell. He's only out a day. Give him time. He'll go back to a moral certainty. Thanks to you, Quok, his pal has a home in Folsom for a bit that'll keep him out of mischief for fifteen years. Clever job, Quok. Without the tip, we'd have never got him. This bird ought to be at Folsom with him. And the man started toward the door. You've sent more crooks to the pen than the whole department. Might drop in later when the bird comes too. Want to break the news that the kid has gone on a long journey. Glancing back in the direction of the man who lay sleeping, he passed through the door. An hour later, Detective Joss Gross of the San Francisco Chinatown squad rapped a signal on a door in a house in Wakeley Avenue. There was no response. Then he tried the door and found it open. Groping his way along the passageway, he stumbled over a body. Stooping, he took an electric flashlight from his pocket, and the first thing its bright rays disclosed was a pool of blood. Then the still, white face of Kwok Wong. The detective didn't stop to notify the morgue. There was more important business at hand. In twenty minutes, a police net had been spread throughout the city for Jimmy Dolan, ex-convict, and until that same morning, known as Convict 7774. It was almost dawn when Gross was summoned to the city hospital. At the door of the accident ward, he was met by a plainclothes man. We got him, Gross, but he put up an awful fight. The doc says he's done for. Light'll go out any minute now. Stepping over to the bedside of the wounded man, Gross bent over him. Dolan opened his eyes when the detective spoke to him. You're gonna die, Bo. Why did you do it? I should worry, the dying man gasped, for I got that dirty yellow snitch. The End of The Snitch by Mert E. Smith From Detective Magazine Volume 6, Number 1, 
January 5th, 1921. Something Provincial by Marjorie Werner Reed. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Something Provincial The little house in Pemberl Square had been vacant for many years. No lights through the closed shutters, no smoke from the chimneys. Evening. An old woman was sitting on the doorstep muttering to herself in some strange tongue. Her vague eyes saw neither the square nor its straight rows of trees, only something far away, a memory perhaps, some tragedy lay hidden in her heart. Many years ago the small house had been occupied by a family with several children, children that played games in the great garden behind. A young woman had been much with the little troop of children. They had all loved her who played with them as if a child herself and in happy hours had sung French songs to them. She had gone away, they had heard, to the island of Madeira, and the children soon forgot their sweet friend. On the steps of this now abandoned house sat the muttering old woman. The sound of quick steps aroused her. She peered through the gathering gloom. A young man was coming nearer. The woman rose slowly to her feet and waited rigidly. It is you, you, she whispered hoarsely. Her words went like shots at the slight figure, now perceptible. He stopped abruptly and shuddered like one accused of crime. I do not know you, he managed to say. He had a flat, thin voice. You once lived in this house, the woman said menacingly. He shuddered again and stepped back. The young man began to wonder. Could she be the sweet French woman that the village children had loved? That he, the eldest of the little group, had in his boyish awakening been romantic over? The gypsy sensed his admission of her charge. She went on. Do you know who you are? Do you know where you got your black hair? He lifted his hand unsteadily in the direction of his head. The old creature nodded and fixed him with her fierce eyes. I am not your mother. Neither was the woman you called by that name. The young man gasped. His body grew tense. He remembered his adored mother, whose grave he visited every Sunday morning. He made an effort to think that this was only a gypsy, an impostor. The woman was speaking. Neither your father nor mother ever knew that you were not their child. Their little boy is dead. You filled his place. Her voice sank almost to a breath. I placed you in his cradle. An intolerable silence. I loved your father. You never knew that he was a Portuguese nobleman. Did you ever hear of Madeira, she asked sharply. It was there that one by one all the passions of love, hatred, revenge had torn my heart. He married and came to England. I followed, repulsed, ignored. My only weapon against him was to contrive the death of his little son. But to kill a child, she caught a shuddering breath. I could not. I hid it securely. Once again I visited Madeira. On the steps of the church I stabbed my enemy among the flowers in that land of beauty, a crime to darken its perfection. So you belong to me. You owe me much, all that you can pay. The little sum of money he had in the postal savings rose into his mind and gave him amazing steadiness. His voice sounded loud and full in his own ears. You lie, he shouted suddenly. You lie, you fiend. Come into the daylight. He was tearing his mind free from the influence of the place, the shadows, the possessing voice of the woman. She crouched back toward the door. It is you, you, she muttered accusingly. No, by heaven, it's you, he cried. I see through you now. Two men came running, attracted by his loud voice. They lead the gypsy to a place of security. It is you, she kept muttering to each in turn. The young man walked behind with straightened back and shining eyes. End of Something Provincial by Marjorie Werner Reed This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Gift of the Magi by O. Henry 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. One dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all. And sixty cents of it was in pennies. Pennies saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the vegetable man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned with the silent imputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Della counted it, one dollar and eighty-seven cents, and the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop down on the shabby little couch and howl, so Della did it, which instigates the moral reflection that life is made up of sobs, sniffles, and smiles, with sniffles predominating. While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at $8 per week. It did not exactly beggar description, but it certainly had that word on the lookout for the medicancy squad. In the vestibule below was a letter box into which no letter would go, and an electric button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham had been flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity when its possessor was being paid $30 per week. Now, when the income was shrunk to $20, though, they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim, and greatly hugged by Mrs. James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della, which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with the powder rag. She stood by the window and looked out dully at a gray cat walking a gray fence in a gray backyard. Tomorrow would be Christmas Day, and she had only one dollar and eighty-seven cents with which to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months with this result. Twenty dollars a week doesn't go far. Expenses had been greater than she had calculated. They always are. Only one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy a present for Jim. Her Jim. Many a happy hour she had spent planning for something nice for him, something fine and rare and sterling, something just a little bit near to being worthy of the honor of being owned by Jim. There was a pier glass between the windows of the room. Perhaps you have seen a pier glass in an eight-dollar flat. A very thin and very agile person may, by observing his reflection in a rapid sequence of longitudinal strips, obtain a fairly accurate conception of his looks. Della, being slender, had mastered this art. Suddenly, she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brilliantly, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Rapidly, she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now, there were two possessions of the James Dillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was Jim's gold watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window some day to dry, just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor, with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed, just to see him pluck at his beard from envy. So now, Della's beautiful hair fell about her rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her knee and made itself almost a garment for her. And then she did it up again nervously and quickly. Once she faltered for a minute and stood still, while a tear or two splashed on the worn red carpet. On went her old brown jacket... On went her old brown hat. With a whirl of skirts and with the brilliant sparkle still in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Where she stopped, the sign read, Madame Sofrony, hair goods of all kinds. One flight up, Della ran and collected herself, panting. Madame, large, too white, chilly, hardly looked the Sofrony. Will you buy my hair? asked Della. I buy hair, said Madame. 
Take your hat off and let's have a sight at the looks of it. Down rippled the brown cascade. Twenty dollars, said Madame, lifting the mass with a practiced hand. Give it to me quick, said Della. Oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings. Forget the hashed metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she had turned all of them inside out. It was a platinum fob chain, simple and chaste in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by meretricious ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew it must be Jim's. It was like him. Quietness and value, the description applied to both. Twenty-one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents. With that chain on his watch, Jim might be properly anxious about the time in any company. Grand as the watch was, he sometimes looked at it on the sly on account of the old leather strap that he used in place of a chain. When Della reached home, her intoxication gave way, a little, to prudence and reason. She got out her curling irons and lighted the gas and went to work repairing the ravages made by generosity added to love, which is always a tremendous task, dear friends, a mammoth task. Within forty minutes, her head was covered with tiny, close-lying curls that made her look wonderfully like a truant schoolboy. She looked at her reflection in the mirror long, carefully, and critically. If Jim doesn't kill me, she said to herself before he takes a second look at me, he'll say I look like a Coney Island chorus girl. But what could I do? Oh, what could I do with a dollar and eighty-seven cents? At seven o'clock, the coffee was made and the frying pan was on the back of the stove, hot and ready to cook the chops. Jim was never late. Della doubled the fob chain in her hand and sat on the corner of the table near the door that he always entered. Then she heard his step on the stair away down on the first flight, and she turned white for just a moment. She had a habit of saying a little silent prayer about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, Please, God, make him think I am still pretty. The door opened, and Jim stepped in and closed it. He looked thin and very serious. Poor fellow, he was only twenty-two, and to be burdened with a family. He needed a new overcoat, and he was without gloves. Jim stopped inside the door, as immovable as a setter at the scent of a quail. His eyes were fixed upon Della, and there was an expression in them that she could not read, and it terrified her. It was not anger, nor surprise, nor disapproval, nor horror, nor any of the sentiments that she had been prepared for. He simply stared at her fixedly with that peculiar expression on his face. Della wriggled off the table and went for him. Jim, darling, she cried, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful nice gift I've got for you. You've cut off your hair, asked Jim, laboriously, as if he had not arrived at that patent fact yet even after the hardest mental labor. "'Cut it off and sold it,' said Della. "'Don't you like me just as well, anyhow? "'I'm me without my hair, aren't I?' Jim looked about the room curiously. "'You say your hair is gone?' he said, with an air almost of idiocy. "'You needn't look for it,' said Della. "'It's sold, I tell you, sold and gone, too. "'It's Christmas Eve, boy. "'Be good to me, for it went for you.' Maybe the hairs in my head were numbered, she went on with sudden, serious sweetness, but nobody could ever count my love for you. Shall I put the chops on, Jim? Out of his trance, Jim seemed quickly to wake. He enfolded his Della. For ten seconds, let us regard with discreet scrutiny some inconsequential object in the other direction. Eight dollars a week, or a million a year, what is the difference? A mathematician or a wit would give you the wrong answer. The Magi brought valuable gifts, but that was not among them. This dark assertion will be illuminated later on. Jim drew a package from his overcoat pocket and threw it upon the table. Don't make any mistake, Dell, he said, about me. 
I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that could make me like my girl any less, but if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going for a while at first. White fingers and nimble tore at the string and paper, and then an ecstatic scream of joy, and then, alas, a quick feminine change to hysterical tears and wails, necessitating the immediate employment of all the comforting powers of the lord of the flat. For there lay the combs, the set of combs, side and back, that Della had worshipped long in a Broadway window, beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear in the beautiful vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now they were hers, but the tresses that should have adorned the coveted adornments were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and a smile and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim. And then Della leapt up like a singed cat and cried, Oh, oh! Jim had not yet seen his beautiful present. She held it out to him eagerly upon her open palm. The dull, precious metal seemed to flash with a reflection of her bright and ardent spirit. Isn't it a dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Instead of obeying, Jim tumbled down on the couch and put his hands under the back of his head and smiled. Dell said he, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to use just at present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs, and now suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men, wonderfully wise men, who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house, but in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all those who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are wisest. Everywhere, they are the wisest. They are the Magi. End of the Gift of the Magi by O. Henry The Spirit That Lived in a Tree by Marie L. Shedlock This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Garfield D'Souza The Spirit That Lived in a Tree And it came to pass that the Buddha was reborn as a tree spirit. Now there reigned at Benares, at that time a king who said to himself, All over India, the kings live in palaces supported by many a column. I will build me a palace resting on one column only. Then shall I, in truth, be the chiefest of all kings. Now in the king's park was a lordly sal tree, straight and well-grown, worshipped by village and town, and to this tree even the royal family also paid tribute, worship and honour. And then suddenly there came an order from the king that the tree should be cut down. And the people were sore dismayed, but the woodmen, who dared not disobey the orders of the king, came to the park with hands full of perfumed garlands, and encircling the tree with a string, fastened to it a nosegay of flowers, and kindling a lamp, they did worship, exclaiming, O tree, on the seventh day must we cut thee down, for so hath the king commanded. Now let the deities who dwell within thee go elsewhither, and since we are only obeying the king's command, let no blame fall upon us, and no harm come to our children because of this. And the spirit who lived in the tree, hearing these words, reflected within himself and said, These builders are determined to cut down this tree, and to destroy my place of dwelling. 
Now my life lasts only as long as this tree. And lo, all the young sal trees that stand around where dwell the deities, my kinsfolk, and they are many, will be destroyed. My own destruction does not touch me so near as the destruction of my children. Therefore must I protect their lives. Accordingly, at the hour of midnight, adorned in divine splendor, he entered into the magnificent chamber of the king, and filling the whole chamber with a bright radiance, stood weeping beside the king's pillow. At the sight of him, the king, overcome with terror, said, who art thou, standing high in the air, and why do thy tears flow? And the tree god made answer, Within thy realm I am known as the lucky tree. For sixty thousand years have I stood, and all have worshipped me. And though they have built many a house and many a town, no violence has been done to me. Spare thou me also, O king. Then the king made answer and said, Never have I seen so mighty a trunk, so thick and strong a tree. But I will build me a palace, and thou shalt be the only column on which it shall rest, and thou shalt dwell there for ever. And the tree said, Since thou art resolved to tear my body from me, I pray thee cut me down gently, one branch after another, the root last to fall. And the king said, O woodland tree, what is this thou askest of me? It were a painful death to die. One stroke at the root would fell thee to the ground. Why wouldst thou die piecemeal? And the tree made answer, O king, my children, the young sal trees, all grow at my feet. They are prosperous and well sheltered. If I should fall with one mighty crash, Behold, these young children of the forest would perish also. And the king was greatly moved by this spirit of sacrifice, and said, O great and glorious tree, I set thee free from thy fear, and because thou wouldst willingly die to save thy kindred, thou shalt not be cut down. Return to thy home in the ancient forest. End of The Spirit That Lived in a Tree by Mari L. Shedlock Three Deaths by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Three Deaths, A Tale, 1859, Chapter 1 it was autumn. Along the highway came two equipages at a brisk pace. In the first carriage sat two women. One was a lady, thin and pale. The other her maid, with a brilliant red complexion and plump. Her short dry locks escaped from under a faded cap. Her red hand, in a torn glove, put them back with a jerk. Her full bosom, encased in a tapestry shawl, breathed of health. Her restless, black eyes, now gazed through the window at the fields hurrying by them, now rested on her mistress, now peered solicitously into the corners of the coach. Her feet were raised by packages lying on the floor, and could almost be heard drumming upon them above the noise of the creaking of the springs and the rattling of the windows. The lady, with her hands resting in her lap and her eyes shut, feebly swayed on the cushions which supported her back, and, slightly frowning, struggled with a cough. She wore a white nightcap, and a blue neckerchief twisted around her delicate pale neck. A straight line, disappearing under the cap, parted her blonde hair, which was smoothly pomaded, and there was a dry, deathly appearance about the whiteness of the skin in this simple parting. The withered and rather sallow skin was loosely drawn over her delicate and pretty features, and there was a hectic flush on the cheeks and cheekbones. Her lips were dry and restless. Her thin eyelashes had lost their curve, and a cloth-traveling capote made straight folds over her sunken chest. Although her eyes were closed, her face gave the impression of weariness, irascibility, and habitual suffering. 
The lackey, leaning back, was napping on the coach box. The hired driver, shouting in a clear voice, urged on his four powerful and sweaty horses, occasionally looking back at the other driver, who was shouting just behind them in an open barouche. The tires of the wheels, in their even and rapid course, left wide parallel tracks on the limey mud of the highway. The sky was gray and cold. A moist mist was falling over the fields and the road. It was suffocating in the carriage and smelt of eau de cologne and dust. The invalid leaned back her head and slowly opened her eyes. Her great eyes were brilliant and of a beautiful dark color. Again, she said, nervously pushing away with her beautiful attenuated hand the end of her maid's cloak, which occasionally hit against her knee. Her mouth contracted painfully. Matryosha raised her cloak in both hands, lifting herself up on her strong legs, and then sat down again farther away. Her fresh face was suffused with the brilliant scarlet. The invalid's handsome dark eyes eagerly followed the maid's motions, and then with both hands she took hold of the seat and did her best to raise herself a little higher, but her strength was not sufficient. Again her mouth became contracted, and her whole face took on an expression of unavailing, angry irony. If you would only help me. Ah, it's not necessary. I can do it myself. Only have the goodness not to put those pillows behind me. On the whole, you had better not touch me if you don't understand. The lady closed her eyes, and then again, quickly raising the lids, gazed at her maid. Matryosha looked at her and gnawed her red lower lip. A heavy sigh escaped from the sick woman's breast, but the sigh was not ended, but was merged in a fit of coughing. She scowled and turned her face away, clutching her chest with both hands. When the coughing fit was over, she once more shut her eyes and continued to sit motionless. The coach and the barouche rolled into the village. Matryosha drew her fat hand from under her shawl and made the sign of the cross. "'What is this?' demanded the lady. "'A post-station, madame.' Why did you cross yourself? I should like to know. The church, madame. The lady looked out of the window and began slowly to cross herself, gazing with all her eyes at the great village church in front of which the invalid's carriage was now passing. The two vehicles came to a stop together at the post house. The sick woman's husband and the doctor dismounted from the barouche and came to the coach. How are you feeling? asked the doctor, taking her pulse. "'Well, my dear, aren't you fatigued?' asked the husband in French. "'Wouldn't you like to go out?' Matryosha, gathering up the bundles, squeezed herself into the corner so as not to interfere with the conversation. "'No matter, it's all the same thing,' replied the invalid. "'I will not get out.' The husband, after standing there a little while, went into the post-house. Matryosha, jumping from the carriage, tiptoed across the muddy road into the enclosure. "'If I am miserable, there is no reason why the rest of you should not have breakfast,' said the sick woman, smiling faintly to the doctor, who was standing by her window. "'It makes no difference to them how I am,' she remarked to herself as the doctor, turning from her with slow step, started to run up the steps of the station house. "'They are well, and it's all the same to them. Oh, my God!' "'How now, Edward Ivanovich?' said the husband as he met the doctor, and rubbing his hands with a gay smile. "'I have ordered my travelling case brought. What do you say to that?' "'That's worthwhile,' replied the doctor. "'Well, now, how about her?' asked the husband, with a sigh, lowering his voice and raising his brows. "'I have told you that she cannot reach Moscow, much less Italy, especially in such weather. "'What is to be done, then? Oh, my God, my God!' The husband covered his eyes with his hand. Give it here, he added, addressing his man, who came bringing the traveling case. You'll have to stop somewhere on the route, replied the doctor, shrugging his shoulders. But tell me, how can that be done, rejoined the husband. I have done everything to keep her from going. I have spoken to her of our means and of our children whom we should have to leave behind, and of my business. She would not hear a word. She has made her plans for living abroad, as though she were well. But if I should tell her what her real condition is, it would kill her. Well, she is a dead woman now. You may as well know it, Vasily Dmitrich. A person cannot live without lungs, and there is no way of making lungs grow again. It is melancholy, it is hard, but what is to be done about it? It is my business and yours to make her last days as easy as possible. It is the confessor that is needed here. Oh, my God, now just perceive how I am situated. In speaking to her of her last will, let come whatever may, yet I cannot speak of that. 
and yet you know how good she is. Try at least to persuade her to wait until the roads are frozen, said the doctor, shaking his head significantly. Something might happen during the journey. Axiosha, O oh Axiosha, cried the superintendent's daughter, throwing a cloak over her head and tiptoeing down the muddy back steps. Come along, let us have a look at the Shirkinskaya lady. They say she's got lung trouble and they're taking her abroad. I never saw how anyone looked in consumption. Axiosha jumped down from the door sill, and the two girls, hand in hand, hurried out of the gates. Shortening their steps, they walked by the coach and stared in at the lowered window. The invalid bent her head toward them, but when she saw their inquisitiveness, she frowned and turned away. Oh, dear, said the superintendent's daughter, vigorously shaking her head, how wonderfully pretty she used to be, and how she has changed. It is terrible. Did you see? Did you see Axiosha? Yes, but how thin she is, assented Axiosha. Let us go by and look again. We'll make believe go to the well. Did you see? She turned away from us. Still, I got a good view of her. Isn't it too bad, Masha? Yes, but what terrible mud, replied Masha, and both of them started to run back within the gates. It's evident that I have become a fright, thought the sick woman. But we must hurry, hurry, and get abroad, and there I shall soon get well. "'Well, and how are you, my dear?' inquired the husband, coming to the carriage with still a morsel of something in his mouth. "'Always one and the same question,' thought the sick woman, "'and he's even eating. "'It's no consequence,' she murmured between her teeth. "'Do you know, my dear, I am afraid that this journey in such weather will only make you worse. "'Edward Ivanovitch says the same thing. "'Hadn't we better turn back?' she maintained an angry silence. The weather will improve, maybe. The roads will become good, and that would be better for you. Then at least we could start all together. Pardon me, if I had not listened to you so long, I should at this moment be at Berlin, and have entirely recovered. What's to be done, my angel? It was impossible, as you know. But now, if you would wait a month, you would be ever so much better. I could finish up my business, and we could take the children with us. The children are well, and I am ill. But just see here, my love, if in this weather you should grow worse on the road, at least we should be at home. What is the use of being at home? Die at home, replied the invalid peevishly. But the word die evidently startled her, and she turned upon her husband a supplicating and inquiring look. He dropped his eyes and said nothing. The sick woman's mouth suddenly contracted in a childish fashion, and the tears sprang to her eyes. Her husband covered his face with his handkerchief and silently turned from the carriage. No, I will go, cried the invalid, and lifting her eyes to the sky, she clasped her hands and began to whisper incoherent words. My God, why must it be? she said, and the tears flowed more violently. She prayed long and fervently, but still there was just the same sense of constriction and pain in her chest, just the same grey melancholy in the sky and the fields and the road, just the same autumnal mist, neither thicker nor more tenuous, but ever the same in its monotony, falling on the muddy highway, on the roofs, on the carriage, and on the sheepskin coats of the drivers, who were talking in strong, gay voices as they were oiling and adjusting the carriage. Chapter 2 the coach was ready, but the driver loitered. He had gone into the driver's cottage, where it was warm, close, dark, and suffocating, smelling of human occupation, of cooking bread, of cabbage, and of sheepskin garments. Several drivers were in the room. The cook was engaged near the oven, on top of which lay a sick man, wrapped up in pelts. Uncle Hveodor, hey, Uncle Hveodor, called a young man, the driver, in a tulip, and with his knout in his belt, coming into the room and addressing the sick man. What do you want, Rattlepate? What are you calling to Fiedka for? demanded one of the drivers. There's your carriage waiting for you. I want to borrow his boots. Mine are worn out, replied the young fellow, tossing back his curls and straightening his mitts in his belt. Why is he asleep? Say, Uncle Hveodor, he insisted, going to the oven. What is it? A weak voice was heard saying, and a blousy, emaciated face was lifted up from the oven. A broad, gaunt hand, bloodless and covered with hairs, pulled up his overcoat over the dirty shirt that covered his bony shoulder. Give me something to drink, brother. What is it you want? The young fellow handed him a small dish of water. I say, Fiedja, said he, hesitating. I reckon you won't want your new boots now. Let me have them. Probably you won't need them any more. 
the sick man dropping his weary head down to the lacquered bowl and dipping his thin hanging moustache in the brown water drank feebly and eagerly his tangled beard was unclean his sunken clouded eyes were with difficulty raised to the young man's face when he had finished drinking he tried to raise his hand to wipe his wet lips but his strength failed him and he wiped them on the sleeve of his overcoat silently and breathing with difficulty through his nose he looked straight into the young man's eyes and tried to collect his strength maybe you have promised them to someone else said the young driver if that's so all right the worst of it is it is wet outside and i have got to go out to my work and so i said to myself i reckon i'll ask Fyedka for his boots i reckon he won't be needing them but maybe you will need them just say something began to bubble up and rumble in the sick man's chest he bent over and began to strangle with a cough that rattled in his throat now i should like to know where he would need them unexpectedly snapped out the cook angrily addressing the whole hovel this is the second month that he has not crept down from the oven just see how he is all broken up and you can hear how it must hurt him inside where would he need boots they would not think of burying him in new ones and it was time long ago god pardoned me the sin of saying so just see how he chokes he ought to be taken from this hovel to another or somewhere they say there's a hospital in the city but what's you gonna do he takes up the whole room and that's too much there isn't any room at all and yet you are expected to keep neat hey serioja come along take your place the people are waiting cried the headman of the station coming to the door serioja started to go without waiting for his reply but the sick man during his cough intimated by his eyes that he was going to speak you can take the boots sarioha said he conquering the cough and getting his breath a little only do you hear buy me a stone when i am dead he added hoarsely thank you uncle then i will take them and as for the stone hey hey i will buy you one there children you are witnesses the sick man was able to articulate and then once more he bent over and began to choke all right we have heard said one of the drivers but run serioha or else the starosta will be after you again you know lady shurkinskaya is sick serioha quickly pulled off his ragged unwieldy boots and flung them under the bench uncle feodor's fitted his feet exactly and the young driver could not keep his eyes off them as he went to the carriage eek what splendid boots here's some grease called another driver with the grease pot in his hand as serioha mounted to his box and gathered up his reins get them for nothing so you're jealous are you cried serioha lifting up and tucking around his legs the tails of his overcoat off with you my darlings he cried to the horses cracking his knout and the coach and barouche with their occupants trunks and other belongings were hidden in the thick autumnal mist and rapidly whirled away over the wet road the sick driver remained on the oven in the stifling hovel and not being able to throw off the phlegm by a supreme effort turned over on the other side and stopped coughing till evening there was a continual coming and going and eating of meals in the hovel and the sick man was not noticed before night came on the cook climbed upon the oven and pulled off the sheepskin from his legs don't be angry with me natasya murmured the sick man i shall soon leave you your room all right all right it's of no consequence but what is the matter with you uncle tell me all oh, my innards are gnawed out god knows what it is and i don't doubt your gullet hurts you when you cough so it hurts me all over my death is at hand that's what it is oh 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 groaned the sick man now cover up your legs this way said natasya comfortingly arranging the overcoat so that it would cover him and then getting down from the oven during the night the hovel was faintly lighted by a single taper nastasia and a dozen drivers were sleeping snoring loudly on the floor and the benches only the sick man feebly choked and coughed and tossed on the oven in the morning no sound was heard from him i saw something wonderful in my sleep said the cook as she stretched herself in the early twilight the next morning i seemed to see uncle Feodor get down from the oven and go out to cut wood look here says he i'm going to help you nasia and i says to him how can you split wood but he seizes the hatchet and begins to cut so fast so fast that nothing but chips fly why says i ain't you been sick no says he i am well and he kind of lifted up the axe and i was scared and i screamed and woke up he can't be dead can he uncle feodor hey uncle feodor did not move 
Now we can't be dead, can he? Go and see, said one of the drivers who had just waked up. The emaciated hand, covered with reddish hair that hung down from the oven, was cold and pale. Go tell the superintendent it seems he is dead, said the driver. Fyodor had no relatives. He was a stranger. On the next day they buried him in the new burying ground behind the grove. Anastasia, for many days, had to tell everybody of the dream which she had seen, and how she had been the first to discover that Uncle Fyodor was dead. Chapter 3 Spring had come. Along the wet streets of the city, swift streamlets ran purling between bits of ice. Bright were the colors of people's dresses and the tones of their voices as they hurried along. In the walled gardens, the buds on the trees were burgeoning, and the fresh breeze swayed their branches with a soft, gentle murmur. Everywhere transparent drops were forming and falling. The sparrows chattered incoherently and fluttered about on their little wings. On the sunny side, on the walls, houses, and trees, all was full of life and brilliancy. The sky and the earth and the heart of man overflowed with youth and joy. In front of the great seigneurial mansion, in one of the principal streets, fresh straw was laid. In the house lay that same invalid whom we saw hastening abroad. Near the closed doors of the house stood the sick lady's husband and a lady well along in years. On a sofa sat the confessor with cast-down eyes, holding something wrapped up under his stole. In one corner, in a Voltaire easy chair, reclined an old lady, the sick woman's mother, weeping violently. Near her the maid stood holding a clean handkerchief, ready for the old lady's use when she should ask for it. Another maid was rubbing the old lady's temples and blowing on her gray head underneath her cap. Well, Christ be with you, my dear, said the husband to the elderly lady who was standing with him near the door. She has such confidence in you. You know how to talk with her. Go and speak with her a little while, my darling. Please go. He was about to open the door for her, but his cousin held him back, putting her handkerchief several times to her eyes and shaking her head. There now she will not see that I have been weeping, said she, and opening the door herself, went to the invalid. The husband was in the greatest excitement and seemed quite beside himself. He started to go over to the old mother, but after taking a few steps he turned around, walked the length of the room, and approached the priest. The priest looked at him, raised his brows toward heaven, and sighed. The thick gray beard was lifted and fell again. My God, my God, said the husband. What can you do? exclaimed the confessor, sighing and again lifting up his brows and beard and letting them drop. And the old mother here, exclaimed the husband, almost in despair, she will not be able to endure it. You see, she loved her so, she loved her so that she, I don't know, you might try, holy father, to calm her a little and persuade her to go away. The confessor arose and went over to the old lady. It is true, no one can appreciate a mother's heart, said he, but God is compassionate. The old lady's face was suddenly convulsed, and a hysterical sob shook her frame. God is compassionate, repeated the priest, when she had grown a little calmer. I will tell you, in my parish, there was a sick man, and much worse than Maria Dmitrievna, and he, though he was only a shopkeeper, was cured in a very short time by means of herbs, and this same shopkeeper is now in Moscow. I have told Vasily Dmitrievich about him. It might be tried, you know. At all events, it would satisfy the invalid. With God, all things are possible." No, she won't get well, persisted the old lady. Why should God have taken her and not me? And again the hysterical sobbing overcame her so violently that she fainted away. The invalid's husband hid his face in his hands and rushed from the room. In the corridor, the first person whom he met was a six-year-old boy who was chasing his little sister with all his might and main. Do you bid me take the children to their mamma? inquired the nurse. No, she is not able to see them. They distract her. The lad stopped for a moment, and after looking eagerly into his father's face, he cut a dido with his leg, and with merry shouts ran on. I'm playing she's a horse, Papasha, cried the little fellow, pointing to his sister. 
Meantime, in the next room, the cousin had taken her seat near the sick woman, and was skilfully bringing the conversation by degrees round, so as to prepare her for the thought of death. The doctor stood by the window, mixing some draught. The invalid, in a white dressing-gown, all surrounded by cushions, was sitting up in her bed, and gazed silently at her cousin. "'Ah, my dear!' she exclaimed, unexpectedly interrupting her. "'Don't try to prepare me. Don't treat me like a little child. I am a Christian woman. I know all about it. I know that I have not long to live. I know that if my husband had heeded me sooner, I should have been in Italy, and possibly, yes, probably, should have been well by this time. They all told him so.' But what is to be done? It is God saw fit. We all of us have sinned, I know that. But I hope in the mercy of God that all will be pardoned, ought to be pardoned. I am trying to sound my own heart. I also have committed many sins, my love. But how much I have suffered in atonement. I have tried to bear my sufferings patiently. Then shall I have the confessor come in, my love? It will be all the easier for you after you have been absolved, said the cousin. "'Oh, God, pardon me, a sinner,' she whispered. The cousin went out and beckoned to the confessor. "'She is an angel,' she said to the husband with tears in her eyes. The husband wept. The priest went into the sick room. The old lady still remained unconscious, and in the room beyond all was perfectly quiet. At the end of five minutes the confessor came out and, taking off his stole, arranged his hair. Thanks be to the Lord, she is calmer now, said he. She wishes to see you. The cousin and the husband went to the sick room. The invalid, gently weeping, was gazing at the images. I congratulate you, my love, said the husband. Thank you. How will I feel now? What ineffable joy I experience, said the sick woman, and a faint smile played over her thin lips. How merciful God is. Is it not so? He is merciful and omnipotent. And again with an eager prayer, she turned her tearful eyes towards the holy images. Then suddenly something seemed to occur to her mind. She beckoned to her husband. You are never willing to do what I desire, said she in a weak and querulous voice. The husband, stretching his neck, listened to her submissively. What is it, my love? How many times I have told you that these doctors don't know anything. There are uneducated women doctors. They make cures. That's what the good father said. A shopkeeper. Send for him. For whom, my love? Good heavens, you can never understand me. And the dying woman frowned and closed her eyes. The doctor came to her and took her hand. Her pulse was evidently growing feebler and feebler. He made a sign to the husband. The sick woman remarked this gesture and looked around in fright. The cousin turned away to hide her tears. Don't weep, don't torment yourselves on my account, said the invalid. That takes away from me my last comfort. You are an angel, exclaimed the cousin, kissing her hand. No, kiss me here. They only kiss the hands of those who are dead. My God, my God. That same evening the sick woman was a corpse, and the corpse in the coffin lay in the parlor of the great mansion. In the immense room, the doors of which were closed, sat the clerk, and with a monotonous voice read the Psalms of David through his nose. The bright glare from the wax candles in the lofty silver candelabra fell on the white brow of the dead, on the heavy waxen hands, on the stiff folds of the cerement which brought out into awful relief the knees and the feet, the clerk, not varying his tones, continued to read on steadily, and in the silence of the chamber of death his words rang out and died away. Occasionally from distant rooms came the voice of children and their romping. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. The glory of the Lord shall endure for ever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. The face of the dead was stern and majestic, but there was no emotion either on the pure cold brow or the firmly closed lips. She was all attention, but did she perhaps now understand these grand words? Chapter 4 At the end of a month, over the grave of the dead, a stone chapel was erected. 
Over the drivers there was as yet no stone, and only the fresh green grass sprouted over the mound that served as the sole record of the past existence of a man. It will be a sin and a shame, Serioja, said the cook at the station house one day, if you don't buy a gravestone for Veodor. You kept saying it's winter, it's winter, but now why don't you keep your word? I heard it all. He has already come back once to ask why you don't do it. If you don't buy him one, he will come again. He will choke you. Well, now, have I denied it? urged Serioja. I am going to buy him a stone, as I said I would. I can get one for a ruble and a half. I have not forgotten about it. I'll have to get it. As soon as I happen to be in town, then I'll buy him one. You ought to at least put up a cross. That's what you ought to do, said an old driver. It isn't right at all. You're wearing those boots now. Yes, but where could I get a cross? You wouldn't want to make one out of an old piece of stick, would you? What is that you say, make it out of an old piece of stick? No, take your axe, go out to the wood a little earlier than usual, and you can hew him out one. Take a little ash tree, and you can make one. You can have a covered cross. If you go then, you won't have to give the watchman a little drink of vodka. One doesn't want to give vodka for every trifle. Now, yesterday, I broke my axle tree, and I go and I hew out a new one of green wood. No one said a word. Early the next morning, almost before dawn, Serioja took his axe and went to the wood. Over all things hung a cold, dead veil of falling mist, as yet untouched by the rays of the sun. The cast gradually grew brighter, reflecting its pale light over the vault of heaven, still covered by light clouds. Not a single grass blade below, not a single leaf on the topmost branches of the treetop waved. Only from time to time could be heard the sounds of fluttering wings in the thicket, or rustling on the ground broke in upon the silence of the forest. Suddenly a strange sound, foreign to this nature, resounded and died away at the edge of the forest. Again the noise sounded, and was monotonously repeated again and again at the foot of one of the ancient immovable trees. A treetop began to shake in an extraordinary manner. The juicy leaves whispered something, and the warbler, sitting on one of the branches, flew off a couple of times with a shrill cry, and wagging its tail finally perched on another tree. The axe rang more and more frequently. The white chips, full of sap, were scattered upon the dewy grass, and a slight cracking was heard beneath the blows. The tree trembled with all its body, leaned over, and quickly straightened itself with a fearful shudder on its base. For an instant all was still, then once more the tree bent over. A crash was heard in its trunk, and tearing the thicket and dragging down the branches, it plunged toward the damp earth. The noise of the axe and of footsteps ceased. The warbler uttered a cry and flew higher. The branch which she grazed with her wings shook for an instant, and then came to rest, like all the others with their foliage. The trees, more joyously than ever, extended their branches over the new space that had been made in their midst. The first sunbeams, breaking through the cloud, gleamed in the sky and shone along the earth and heavens. The mist in billows began to float along the hollows. The dew, gleaming, played on the green foliage. Translucent white clouds hurried along their azure path. The birds hopped about in the thicket and, as though beside themselves, voiced their happiness. The juicy leaves joyfully and contentedly whispered on the treetops, and the branches of the living trees slowly and majestically waved over the dead and fallen tree. End of Three Deaths by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Nathan Haskell Dole this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two Cases of Grip by M. Quaid This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Two Cases of Grip by M. Quaid "'What's this? What's this?' exclaimed Mr. Bowser as he came home the other evening and found Mrs. Bowser lying on the sofa and looking very much distressed. 
The doctor says it's grip, a second attack, she explained. I was taken with a chill and headache about noon, and grip, second attack, that's all nonsense, Mrs. Bowser. Nobody can have grip a second time. But the doctor said so. Then the doctor is an idiot, and I'll tell him so to his face. I know what's the matter with you. You've been walking around the backyard barefoot, or doing some other foolish thing. I expected it, however. No woman is happy unless she's flat down about half the time. How on earth any of your sex managed to live to be twenty years old is a mystery to me. The average woman has no more sense than a rag baby. I haven't been careless, she replied. I know better. Of course you have. If you hadn't been, you wouldn't be where you are. Grip be hanged. Well, it's only right that you should suffer for it. Call it what you wish, but don't expect any sympathy from me. While I use every precaution to preserve my health, you go sloshing around in your bare feet, or sit on a cake of ice to read a dime novel, or do some other tomfool thing to flatten you out. I refuse to sympathize with you, Mrs. Bowser, absolutely and teetotaling refuse to utter one word of pity. Mrs. Bowser had nothing to say in reply. Mr. Bowser ate his dinner alone, took advantage of the occasion to drive a few nails and make a great noise, and by and by went off to his club and was gone until midnight. Next morning, Mrs. Bowser felt a bit better and made a heroic attempt to be about until he started for the office. The only reference he made to her illness was to say, if you live to be three hundred years old, you may possibly learn something about the laws of health and be able to keep out of bed three days in a week. Mrs. Bowser was all right at the end of three or four days, and nothing more was said. Then, one afternoon at three o'clock, a carriage drove up, and a stranger assisted Mr. Bowser into the house. He was looking pale and ghastly, and his chin quivered and his knees wobbled. "'What is it, Mr. Bowser?' she exclaimed, as she met him at the door. "'Bed! Doctor! Death!' he gasped in reply. Mrs. Bowser got him to bed and examined him for bullet holes or knife wounds. There were none. He had no broken limbs. He hadn't fallen off a horse or been half drowned. When she had satisfied herself on these points, she asked, how were you taken? Well, with a ch ch chill, he gasped. With a ch chill and a, a backache. I thought so, Mr. Bowser. You have the grip, a second attack. As I have some medicine left, there's no need to send for a doctor. I'll have you all right in a day or two. Get the doctor at once, wailed Mr. Bowser, or I'm a dead man. Such a backache, so cold. Mrs. Bowser, if I would d d die, I hope. Emotion overcame Mr. Bowser, and he could say no more. The doctor came and pronounced it a second attack of the grip, but a very mild one. When he had departed, Mrs. Bowser didn't accuse Mr. Bowser with putting on his summer flannels a month too soon, with forgetting his umbrella and getting soaked through, with leaving his rubbers at home and having damp feet all day. She didn't express her wonder that he hadn't died years ago, nor predict that when he reached the age of Methuselah, he would know better than to roll up snow banks and stand around in mud puddles. She didn't kick over chairs or slam doors, or leave him alone. When Mr. Bowser shed tears, she wiped them away. When he moaned, she held his hand. When he said he felt that the grim specter was near and wanted to kiss the baby goodbye, she cheered him with the prediction that he would be a great deal better next day. Mr. Bowser couldn't get up the next day, though the doctor said he could. He lay in bed and sighed and uttered sorrowful moans and groans. He wanted toasts and preserves. He had to have help to turn over. He worried about a relapse. 
he had to have a damp cloth for his forehead he wanted to have a council of doctors and he read a copy of his last will and testament over three times mr bowser was all right next morning however when mrs bowser asked him how he felt he replied how do i feel why as right as a trivet of course when a man takes the care of himself that i do when he has the nerve and willpower i have he can throw off most anything you would have died mrs bowser but i was scarcely affected it was just a play spell i'd like to be real sick once just to see how it would seem cholera i suppose it was but outside of feeling a little tired i wasn't at all affected and the dutiful mrs bowser looked at him and swallowed it all and never said a word to hurt his feelings the end of two cases of grip by m quaid an uncomfortable bed by guy de maupassant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by dale grothman an uncomfortable bed by guy de maupassant one autumn i went to stay for the hunting season with some friends in a chateau in picardy my friends were fond of practical joking as all my friends are i do not care to know any other sort of people when i arrived they gave me a princely reception which at once aroused distrust in my breast we had some capital shooting they embraced me they cajoled me as if they expected to have great fun at my expense i said to myself look out old ferret they have something in preparation for you during the dinner the mirth was excessive far too great in fact i thought here are people who take a double share of amusement and apparently without reason they must be looking out in their own minds for some good bit of fun assuredly i am to be the victim of the joke attention during the entire evening everyone laughed in an exaggerated fashion i smelled a practical joke in the air as a dog smells game but what was it i was watchful restless i did not let a word or a meaning or a gesture escape me everyone seemed to me an object of suspicion and i looked distrustfully at the faces of the servants the hour rang for going to bed and the whole household came to escort me to my room why they called to me good night i entered the apartment shut the door and remained standing without moving a single step holding the wax candle in my hand i heard laughter and whispering in the corridor without doubt they were spying on me i cast a glance around the walls the furniture the ceiling the hangings the floor i saw nothing to justify suspicion i heard persons moving about the outside of my door i had no doubt that they were looking through the keyhole an idea came into my head my candle may suddenly go out and leave me in darkness then i went across to the mantelpiece and lighted all the wax candles that were on it after that i cast another glance around me without discovering anything i advanced with short steps carefully examining the apartment nothing i inspected every article one after the other still nothing i went over to the window the shutters, large wooden shutters, were open. I shut them with great care, and then drew the curtains, enormous velvet curtains, and I placed a chair in front of them, so as to have nothing to fear from without. Then I cautiously sat down. The armchair was solid. 
I did not venture to get into the bed. However, time was flying, and I ended by coming to the conclusion that I was ridiculous. If they were spying on me, as I suppose they must, while waiting for the success of the joke they had been preparing for me, have been laughing enormously at my terror. So I made up my mind to go to bed. But the bed was particularly suspicious-looking. I pulled at the curtains. They seemed to be secure. All the same, there was danger. I was going, perhaps, to receive a cold shower-bath from overhead, or perhaps, the moment I stretched myself out, to find myself sinking under the floor with my mattress. I searched in my memory for all the practical jokes of which I had ever had experience. And I did not want to be caught. Ah, certainly not, certainly not. Then I suddenly besought myself of a precaution which I consider one of extreme efficacy. I caught hold of the side of the mattress gingerly, and very slowly drew it toward me. It came away, followed by the sheet and the rest of the bedclothes. I dragged all these objects into the middle of the room, facing the entrance door. I made my bed over again as best I could, at some distance from the suspected bedstead, and the corner which had filled me with such anxiety. Then I exhausted all the candles, and groped my way. I slipped under the bedclothes. For at least another hour I remained awake, starting at the slightest sound. Everything seemed quiet in the chateau. I fell asleep. I must have been in a deep sleep for a long time, but all of a sudden I was awakened with a start by the fall of a heavy body tumbling right on top of my own body, and, at the same time, I received on my face, on my neck, and on my chest a burning liquid which made me utter a howl of pain and a dreadful noise, as if a sideboard laden with plates and dishes had fallen down, penetrated my ears. I felt myself suffocating under the weight that was crushing me, and preventing me from moving. I stretched out my hand to find out what was the nature of this object. I felt a face, a nose, and whiskers. Then, with all my strength, I launched out a blow over this face but I immediately received a hail of cuffings, which made me jump straight out of the soaked sheets and rush in my nightshirt into the corridor, the door of which I found open. Oh, stupor! It was broad daylight. The noise brought my friends hurrying into the apartment, and we found, sprawled over my improvised bed, the dismayed valet, who, while bringing me my morning cup of tea, had tripped over this obstacle in the middle of the floor, and fallen on his stomach, spilling, in spite of himself, my breakfast over my face. The precautions I had taken in closing the shutters and going to sleep in the middle of the room had only brought about the interlude I had been striving to avoid. Ah, how they all laughed that day! The End of An Uncomfortable Bed by Guy de Maupassant A Weapon of the Law by George W. Brooker This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman a Weapon of the Law by George W. Brooker It was very still in the library where Judge Lathrop sat reading. The lamp on the table at his elbow shed a soft circle of light in the center of the room, leaving the outer edges dim and shadowy. The house was quiet. A small clock in the room had already struck one. The judge's wife and daughter had been in bed for some hours. At last 
the judge put down the legal tome and sat thinking over what he had read he became so lost in meditation that the door at his left was quietly opened and closed without his hearing it then a low cough brought him out of his abstraction he turned and gazed at the intruder the man he saw standing near the door in the semi-darkness was about his own age that is to say somewhat over forty years he was dressed in shabby clothes that seemed a trifle too large for him a slouch hat was pulled down over his eyes his right hand was thrust in the side pocket of his coat even in that subdued light the gleam of triumph in his eyes was only too apparent judge lathrop stared at him blankly without moving a bustle well judge said the man with a short hard laugh can you place me we've met before then asked the judge calmly met before that's good the man chuckled evilly you bet your life we met before then i beg your pardon you see you're standing in the shadow if you'd be so good as to turn the switch the man eyed him distrustfully none of your tricks now the switch is directly behind you you can find it without turning the judge went on in an even voice without removing his eyes from judge lathrop the man groped for the switch found it and flooded the room with light then he pushed his hat back and planted himself brazenly before the judge a sneering smile on his lips maybe you remember me now the judge looked him over carefully and coolly and as he turned away his eyes a look of contempt spread over his face harumph jack dodd i believe you called yourself a cheap crook a low-down thief scum of the earth sudden anger flared up in the man's eyes you be damn careful what you say he said between clenched teeth five years ago i sentenced you to ten years imprisonment continued the judge as if he had not heard yes hissed the man and i swore then if i ever got the chance i'd get you and get you good i suppose you escaped from jail you suppose right and i got these duds well never mind where i got them hell we're wasting time i come here to get even with you you dog the judge folded his hands and smiled i hope you brought a revolver he spoke anxiously the man stared at him for a moment then brought an automatic out of his coat pocket i got a gun all right and i hope you're going to kill me said the judge in a lifeless tone this time the man's jaw dropped a little it was plain he was puzzled then he brought his jaw together grimly that's why i'm here he said roughly the judge looked at the man with a smile of thankfulness on his face jack dodd fate has sent you here at the right moment say what are you driving at demanded jack dodd uneasily the judge leaned back in his chair with his chin on his breast i have a nasty cowardly job on my hands mr jack dodd now you can do it for me dirty work eh sneered dodd when i'm through with you you won't have to worry about that you promise me that said the judge looking at him earnestly cut out the mystery snapped dodd impatiently what's in your bonnet again the judge dropped his eyes to the rug there was a pause before he spoke when you entered this room he said slowly i was on the point of taking my own life what said dodd in an astonished whisper the judge nodded suicide is always a low thing a coward's trick dodd but now i'm saved that you can kill me dodd dodd stared at him a little taken back you mean you want me to kill you if you will dodd answered the judge pleadingly the other made an impatient movement that's bunk 
Why do you want to pass out? You got everything to live for. God, my son was arrested tonight for embezzlement. Tomorrow the papers will be full of it. My name has never been tarnished before. The disgrace of it will be more than I can bear. I prefer to die rather than face it. Dodd gave a laugh. So the honorable judge has a crook in his family. No wonder you ain't got the nerve to face it. The upright Judge Lathrop, all for law and order, no mercies for criminals. Cripes! That's the best revenge I've heard yet. Don't, don't, moaned the judge as he hid his face in his hands. Go on, suffer, go on, chuckled Dodd. I'm eating it up. The judge suddenly sat up and extended his arms sidewise. Shoot me, Dodd, he begged. Put an end to it. Dodd, for God's sake. Shoot you, laughed Dodd. I guess not. I've got half a mind to stick here and make you face the music. I'd go back and do my bit with a smile on my mug if I could see you dragged in the slime. The judge's manner suddenly changed. He flashed a dark look at Dodd. You're afraid to shoot, he said in sullen anger. You haven't got the nerve, you yellow pup. The prison pallor on Dodd's face went whiter still. He pressed his lips together, but said nothing. You low-livered degenerate skunk, the judge flung at him. I wish I had given you twenty years. Dodd's hand tightened on the automatic. His mouth began to twitch. Look out, you! He ripped out a stinging oath. That's it, Dodd, cried the judge. Shoot! Shoot! So that's it, snarled Dodd, trying to egg me on to shoot, eh? Well, it won't work, mister. I won't shoot you now if you called me a dude. Is that final, Dodd? You won't do as I ask? Surest thing you know, you're going to live and get your dose of misery. Then I'll do it myself. The judge turned to the table at his elbow and pulled open the drawer. There, in the front of the drawer, lay a blue steel revolver. Dodd, who was watching him narrowly, sprang forward with a cry as he caught sight of it. Before Judge Lathrop could get his hands on the gun in the drawer, Dodd had clapped his own hand, that held the automatic, over it. "'I tell you, you gotta live!' he cried, frowning down at the judge. The judge returned this gaze and for a second they measured each other with their eyes. Then, with his eyes still fastened on Dodd, the judge suddenly gave a mighty push and jammed the table drawer shut. There was a howl of pain from Dodd, and the drawer was deep enough so one could hear the automatic fall on the wooden bottom. The judge eased the drawer a trifle, at the same time shoving at Dodd with his foot. Dodd staggered across the room, where he stood, wringing his hands in agony of pain. The judge quickly opened the drawer, picked up the automatic, and covered Dodd with it. Jack Dodd, said the judge, the crime for which I sentenced you was one of the filthiest, vilest deeds on the criminal calendar. It will give me great pleasure to return you to your keepers. You, you... Dodd sputtered. A trick! A damnable trick! Yes, a trick, Dodd. There are other weapons besides firearms. Dodd's lips curled back from his teeth with venom. I hope that son of yours ends up in the electric chair! And then followed a string of vile oaths. My dear Dodd, said the judge as he took up the receiver to telephone the police, I have no son. The End of A Weapon of the Law by George W. Brooker Whose Dog? by Francis Gregg This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org read by dale grothman 
Whose Dog? by Francis Gregg. Hey, there's ladies here. Move on, you. The tone was authoritative, and old John, the village drunkard, crouched away. I weren't doing nothing, he clutched feebly at the loose hanging rags that clothed him. Only wanted to see same as them. Guess this pier's big enough to hold us all. Hello, John. Have a drink. A grinning boy held a can of salt water toward him. The big, maudlin tears sprang to the old man's eyes. Little fellers, he muttered. Little fellers, they oughtn't to act that way. Give him a new necktie. He's going to go to dinner with the lodge. A handful of dank seaweed writhed around the old man's neck. That's a turtle, that is, the boy went on, the need for imparting information justifying his lapse in ragging the drunkard. There, swimming around. It's tied to that stake. You ought to have seen it at low tide when it was on the beach. It weighs ninety pounds. I've seen a turtle once, the drunkard quavered. It was bigger than that, and they tied it to a stake, and it swam around, and it swam around. His sodden brain clutched at something more to say, some marvel with which to hold the interest of the gathered boys. It was good to talk, if only they would let him talk to them, if only they would let him sit on the store porch and smoke and gossip. He wouldn't be the town disgrace. Well, go on. What are you do? Hey, you, the boys were interrupted by the authoritarian voice. I told you to move on, didn't I? Now, if I have to tell you again, I'll run you in. Do you hear? What you boys let this old bum hang around with you for anyway? What's he a-doing here? Ah, oh, he's fun. He ain't doing nothing. He was just a-watching it swim. It's tied to that post. It don't come up no more. Watching it swim, eh, was he? All right. Whose dog is it? The officer turned and sauntered away. Sudden horror seized the old man. The liquor seemed to drain out of his veins. His brain worked almost quickly. Whose dog? Whose dog? Say, he darted after the retreating boys. Say, that ain't no dog, is it? No dog? Tied up like that to drown? Say... Aw, oh, keep off. I've told you once, it's a turtle for the lodge dinner. The boy shook himself free. The old man stood a moment, shaken. His pulpy brain worked dimly toward the conception of the pain that was consuming him. Whose dog? that man had asked, and he hadn't meant to help it. Whose dog? They could do it, tie up a dog to drown in sight of people like that. Cruel. He saw the policeman coming toward him again. In a sudden frenzy, he clutched his tattered garments about him and began to run, to run toward the end of the pier. The boys raced after him. What are you going to do? they shouted. What are you going to do? The old man turned and looked at them a moment with twitching features. I'm not going to die, he said. Come on, fellers, come on. The drunk's going to dive. Come on, he's crying. There was a splash. A surge of green filth and mud spread and dyed the water. A row of expectant heads leaned over the rail. Say, he ain't coming up. They waited. The policeman strolled leisurely down in response to their repeated cries. Who ain't coming up? What, him, the drunk? The officer leaned lethargically over the rail. What am I going to do? Why, leave him. He ain't got no folks going to sit up nights waiting for him. Now you young ones, go along home to your suppers, he indignantly commanded. And you little fellers, if you want crabs, be round here early. By tomorrow this place will be fairly swarming with them. The End of Whose Dog? by Francis Gregg